things because those are not um, uh, part of the process of having these virtual meetings per the instructions. So I just want to let the public know that the way to participate is to participate through the use of CMT. Now, if you don't have a CMT device, members of the public, there is public access to one, and though that is available at the Tampa Convention Center, which is open to now open tonight for that purpose. And the hearings, if you don't have a CMT device and want to participate, it's at 333 South Franklin Street at the channel entrance. The written material that have been distributed by count, uh, to council, um, either via email or regular US mail, as I say, have been distributed to city council and are now being made tonight as part of the record of tonight's hearings. So with that being said, Mr. Chairman, I turn the meeting back to you. Thank you very much. All right, so we have a walk-on item. We have a couple people speaking on this walk-on item. If we'd like to uh, take that on, it's not on the agenda, but um, you should have received a copy of what it is, and, and they'll explain it to you now. So whoever would like to begin, go ahead. Hi, this is Rob Rosner, Director of Economic Opportunity. Uh, as you'll see, I put a, a memo on the front of this. Uh, the Uptown uh, project up there at the University Mall uh, is in need of a release of a portion of a water line easement in order to uh, uh, close on a property that is going to be a $60 million uh, student housing project. It's their kickoff project to start the renovations and the uh, rehabilitation of this area. And uh, the lender has uh, told us that this is a, a critical item for them to have released in order to close on their uh, lending. And uh, it's kind of found out at the last minute that this was an issue. This is very unusual for a lender to have that requirement. So we wanted to uh, be able to not hold that up. And, and this is a very time sensitive project because they have to be done by uh, June of 2022, and they have to start construction in November. So with that, I have Mark Sharp here and uh, Elise uh, Batzel, who are representing the uh, Tampa Innovation Partnership. If you'd like to ask them any questions, but that's the reason for uh, this to be a walk on because it's a time sensitive issue. Uh, this is normally done after closing, but this lender uh, in the face of COVID is being more particular than most lenders. But uh, it is it's very time sensitive and we apologize for it being such short notice. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Commissioner Sharp. Mr. Sharp, you're not being heard. You're frozen. I had a question to Rob Rosner. Go ahead, Councilman Dingsfelder. We we can't see you. I don't know where your your camera's at. And just a reminder, just a reminder to City Council, when you turn your camera off, it's as if you are not in attendance at the meeting. So just please be advised that if you are intending to participate and intend to have your vote counted, just please be sure to keep your cameras on. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Dingfelder. I'm ready for any question you might have. No comment, Mr. Shelby. Um, yeah, uh, Rob, I guess it goes without saying, but I want you to say it on the record. Um, so this is a vacating of a water easement and, uh, and um, the, uh, my question is an obvious one, but uh, I would assume that all the all the various departments, uh, especially the water department, has looked at this and signed off on it because even though I've heard about paperwork, I haven't actually visited the paperwork. So I will trust your comments. Okay, yes. Yeah, so they've received their letter of commitment from the water department that was done August 27th. Uh, they're in for permitting. Their, their documents are already there. Um, usually closing happens once those commitments are done and they're ready to go and usually closing happens and then any follow-up documentation comes right afterwards. So um, other developers have had similar issues. Um, we recently had one where a permit was, had not been closed out when it was two years old and uh, we were able to resolve that and but they just needed to know are we going to do this and then they were able to close. And we resolved that a few a few weeks after the fact. But th this developer, we tried to approach them and ask them to, you know, what a letter of intent and 
promised to get it done in a few weeks like we would normally do. And they said, no, you know, it's too time sensitive and, and we're not going to do it. So, uh, yes, everybody signed off on it. It's uh, in a good place right now. Uh, it's just unfortunate that the lender is uh, being so diligent and their closing is on uh, October 15th. Um, so we apologize again for it being so short notice, but we didn't know that they were going to pull this at the last minute with this particular uh, lender. All right. Any other questions? If I may, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Go ahead. And I have to talk on the phone to speak. There's something wrong with my computer. Uh, but no, but I, uh, Mr. Rosner mentioned something and he did so with great humility, which is that the city just found out about this uh, concurrently with the, with the developer's uh, attorney and the developer finding out about it recently. Um, I believe it was on Tuesday evening, I, I believe it is. Uh, but but I, I wanted to thank uh, Mr. Rosner, uh, uh, Mr. Bennett, uh, Carol, Carolyn Post and everybody uh, who worked on this so diligently. This is a very, very, very important project uh, for the area and it required really quick action by an administration that already has its hands full and it has about has had about a third to 40% of its workforce uh, taken out at one time or another during COVID. So, um, you know, we spoke to uh, Chief Bennett this morning. Uh, I, I introduced him as the hardest working man in show business. So um, I just, again, wanted to thank everybody who jumped on this last minute with the administration uh, I, from myself and I know from everybody, it's uh, really appreciated. Uh, it, it just is. That, that's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Ron? Yes, good evening, City Council. I'd just like to uh, make a point of, uh, uh, on the record for, this is not a vacating of a, a easement. This is simply a release of easement. So vacating would imply that we would have to go through a public hearing, provide public notice and go through uh, two readings and it would be accomplished by ordinance, whereas this is done by resolution. So it's a different Thank process. Uh, just to clarify also for Ron that this is uh, to get these water lines out of the way where these buildings are going to be going. They're going to be providing new water service, new easement documents, and all those things are currently in the process of being worked out and done. Uh, obviously, I told you we went through the and got their commitments and they're in permitting now. So again, this would have been a matter of course in a normal situation that this lender had made this a in a contingency of their lending. So normally this would be done after closing with no other issue. And with this would have just come at city council on a normal basis and probably would have been a general consent item. So. All right. Anything else? I see Commissioner Sharp. I see Elise Batzel who wishes to speak on this. No? Just great. Uh, Lewis's comments about thank you so much to staff who have been so helpful in working so quickly. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure. I've, maybe my sound's working now. But we, I also, we see you and, and we can hear you. Thank you, sir. I just wanted to um, thank Mr. Rosner and the entire city of Tampa team. Um, when we signed the MOU uh, with the city of Tampa in December between the city and the county, uh, along with um, the anchors uh, institutions in the university area, it was for this purpose. We knew that there would be moments when there would be these issues that might arise uh, because of the complex nature of the city, county, state of Florida, all within that university area, jurisdictional lines. And so um, we just want to thank Rob. He's been participating in all the meetings that we've uh, held uh, when we've had the strategic planning sessions between the city, the county, and our members. And this project um, is incredibly important um, to the Rhythm Development Project. Um, it will trigger a number of other development projects, but concurrently with that we're making sure that we're working with our community we're working with the university area community development corporation um, on a community benefits agreement and other elements to make sure that um, as this project moves forward the community benefits as well and thank you sir and thank all the commissioners or thank all the council members thank you very much anybody else uh mr shelby then do we just need a, a motion to uh approve the partial release of water easement how would we approve this you have been provided, I believe Mr. Massey provided you with a substitute resolution. Is that correct, Mr. Wigginton? That is correct. All right. My my suggestion, Council, would be to uh, accept the substitute and to move the resolution by motion and roll call vote. 
May I have a motion to move the substitute resolution? I'll move. I'll move. We have a motion second. from Councilman Miranda, a second from Councilman Vieira. Roll call vote. Good. Yes. Petro. Petro. Miranda. Yes, Petro. Miranda. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Vieira. Yes. Dinkfelder. Yes. And Maniscalco. Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Okie dokie. That settles that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Thank very, you much. very much. Good day. All right. Um, may I have a motion to open the public hearings items one through eleven? So move, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion from Councilman Miranda, second from Councilman Goose. Is there any objection? Hearing none, by unanimous consent and without any objection, we have opened all the public hearings, one through 11. We will begin with item number one regarding the Imagine 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan. And who is here for item number one? I am. Diego Guerra, Planning Commission staff. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, do I share my screen or? If you'd like to, and then we'll, I'll let you know when we see it. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, we can see it. Go ahead. Okay. Good evening, gentlemen. Diego Guerra, Planning Commission staff. This item is the first reading of the ordinance to update the schedule of projects into the comprehensive plan. This is a routine annual update that is required by Chapter 163 of Florida Statute. Chapter 163 of Florida Statutes requires that the schedule of projects, a subset of the capital improvement program, which addresses the level of service and adopted in the comprehensive plan, be updated on an annual basis. The update will replace the existing schedule of projects found in the comprehensive plan with the schedule list listed in your packets. City staff identified projects within the capital improvements program that affects level of service. And it is these items that make up the schedule of projects, which were then reviewed by the Planning Commission staff. The update is accomplished by ordinance, which is permitted under Chapter 163 and does not follow the typical plan amendment process. Additionally, plans of other agencies are adopted by reference into the schedule through an existing capital improvement policy. Depicted on the slide, as depicted on the slide, there are four program areas included in the schedule, and they are transportation, stormwater, water, and wastewater, which consist of a total of 60 projects that address low of service. The total FY21 through FY25 funding amount is approximately $1.26 billion. Planning Commission staff examined the schedule with respect to the goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive plan. Capital Improvement Policy 1.3.2 dictates that funding should first be expended on the projects that eliminate deficiencies, second, replace needed facilities, or third, to provide for future growth, which consists, excuse me, which is consistent with the city's schedule, schedule allocating approximately 95% of the schedule funding towards projects that eliminate or replace deficiencies. At its 14 September regular meeting, the Planning Commission found the proposed the capital improvement schedule projects, the FY25 capital improvements section schedule projects consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the Imagine 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan and recommend adoption by City Council. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes my presentation. Myself and city staff are available for questions. Do we have any questions? Any questions from council members? Hearing none, all right. Thank you very much. Do we have the city speaking on this item too or no? Okay. Do we have anybody from the public that wishes to uh, speak on this item? No one has registered to speak on this item nor we receive any written comments on this item. All right. Convention Center? This is Eileen Glostario, Planning and Development. There's no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I have a motion to close the public hearing? Mr. Chairman. 
We have a motion closed by Councilman Moran, a second from Councilman Goods. Is there any objection? Hearing none by unanimous consent without any objection, the public hearing is closed. Uh, how we're going to do um, roll call vote, I'll, I'll pick and, you know, who, who's going to read the ordinance, whatever I'll, I'll ask. But when we take um, the roll call votes, I've asked the clerk to mix it up so it's not always in the same order. So after every vote, we'll just randomly choose a different order of people. Um, Council Member Vieira, would you like to read item number one? Sure, Mr. Chair. My pleasure, sir. Uh, I hereby move an ordinance being presented for first reading consideration, an ordinance and amending the Imagine 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan Capital Improvement Section by replacing the Capital Improvement Schedule of Projects with a Capital Improvement Schedule of Projects for fiscal year 2021 through fiscal year 2025, providing for repeal of all ordinances and conflict, providing for severability, uh, providing an effective date. Second, second from Councilmember Miranda, roll call vote, please. Maniscalco? Yes. Goods? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Dietro? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Ending Felder? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on November 5th at 9.30 a.m. All and right. Mr. Chair, if I, if I may, oh. sir. Um, yes, at the beginning, I know there was a continuance, I, I believe, requested on number three, I believe it was. Were we going to take up at the beginning um, uh, continuances and cleaning up the agenda? or I'm going to do it right now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have a request for continuance from item number three, and then four and five cannot be heard tonight. So before we go to item number three, for items four and five, um, May I have a motion to remove this from the agenda? Oh, well, Mr. Chair, madam four and five. Motion from Councilman Good, second from Councilman Miranda. Roll call vote. Petro? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Goods? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Ending Felder? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. All right, and then for item number three, there was a request to continue um, this item. I believe the petitioner might be here. Is that true? Is, is Mr. Mechanic on the line? If you are, uh, turn on your camera and your microphone. I am here. Yes, sir, go yeah. ahead. Uh, well, let's- Thank you, let's uh, first, Mr. Chair. Council members, um, I'm here to request a continuance to December 10th, if possible. I understand you've got full calendars, but uh, we are asking, if you recall, this was continued before because of the question of the historic status of the James, formerly the James Tokely House. And we did not receive a definitive report from the staff. So I'm asking for continuance so that I can appear formally before the HPC and get that determination before we proceed with the zoning uh, hearing on this matter. Any questions for the petitioner? All right, do we have anybody in the public that wishes to uh, speak on the continuance only, not the merits of the case, but the continuance only for item number three? Mr. Chairman, I, I had a question to the clerk. Um, Go ahead. Uh, uh, how many, did we have a lot of folks who were signed up to speak to this item? No. Uh, well, we can ask, you can, do we have an answer to that? Yes. yes, I have approximately five people signed up for this particular item to speak. Right. Now the problem with that, the problem with that council in a virtual environment, it's very difficult for those people to be brought up front to, um, uh, to be able to um, speak, to be able to talk just to the continuance and not hear anything substantive because that would be inappropriate tonight, um, given that the petitioner hasn't made his case. Uh, so council, frankly, uh, it's a difficult situation. Um, if you want to take the time to do that, uh, but frankly, it's very difficult to know if there's anybody out there in the public 
who is within the noticed area and received notice and wants to have the opportunity to, um, to talk to counsel. Um, I don't know how best to do this. Previously, counsel has continued at, uh, um, without taking public comment as to the continuance because in this virtual environment, that's very, very, very difficult. But it's counsel's pleasure. Um, well, Mr. Shelby, we're not, we're, we wouldn't be technically denying anybody their right to speak because if, if the continuance is granted, uh, anyone would have the opportunity to speak when there's a full evidentiary hearing on uh, December 10th, should we grant that. So at the end of the day, people can speak without. Well said, Mr. Chairman, point well taken. All righty. So having said, unless any council members have any objection, because if this is uh, the continuance is granted to December 10th, anyone will be allowed to speak, will have the opportunity to speak, not be allowed to be opportunity to speak, and we will hear the entire case from scratch. And to add to that, Mr. Chairman, and to add to that, Mr. Chairman, it will be um, um, back uh, at in-person meetings or, or a hybrid, depending in December, I can't say, but. But the thing is, um, definitely, it will not be solely virtual in December. Um, All right. I, I do have a question. Go ahead. Oh, do you have my, do you have my video? And there you go. Um, so I know our rules speak to uh, X number of continuance uh, requests. Um, Mr. Mechanic, you had mentioned, I guess, there had been what one prior request for continuance, and this is the second, or did you yes, sir. That's correct. However, I did speak with Ms. O'Dowd and the section of the code that uh, relates to another, uh, two continuances does not apply to this situation. Uh, that code section deals with failure to perfect notice or failure to uh, file a proper site plan, neither of which are applicable here. We simply have asked for a determination of the historic status of the house. We have no control over the staff report. And so in light of the lack of a final determination, I had no choice but to request the ability to appear in front of the HPC. Okay, just wanted to double check that we were abiding by our own rules. <laughs> All right, if there's uh, any other questions or comments, Councilman yeah. Good. So, so, so merely the five that want to speak can only speak on just the continuous, but not the evidential factors of the foregoing case, correct? That's correct. Actually, 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 no, sir, not in a virtual setting because each of those people, we don't know whether they want to speak to a continuous or not. We have no way of knowing they physically or electronically have to be moved forward to participant and then they have to all be brought to council individually uh, to be able to state what they want to state. Um, frankly, uh, I think the chair did characterize, especially with COVID-19, with the emergency rules we're operating under, um, they're certainly uh, um, uh, not prejudiced uh, to the degree that um, the chair articulated very well, I think. So my suggestion would be to, um, and this may come up again in the course of, uh, uh, of these virtual hearings, um, and I had a chance to talk with the clerk about it, about the mechanics involved in having to do that, and it's quite involved to be able to do that. So my recommendation would be uh, for them to make note, because they won't be getting any additional notice, to make note of the fact that if it is continued and they do intend to participate, December 10th um, at uh, 6 o'clock would be the date and the time. Of, of 2020. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. What's the pleasure of council? Anything else? If not, we'll ask for a motion to close and then a, a motion to continue. No, no motion to close. It stays and it remains open. All right. We have a motion, a motion to continue. Councilman Miranda? I'll make a motion to continue item number three, REZ 20 63 to December 10th at uh, 6 30 uh, p.m. Six. And if you'd like, I'd make a number one. And 6 p.m. please. 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Right. We have a second from Councilman Goods. Can we get a roll call vote? Ding Felder? Yes. Petro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. 
Vieira? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. And Goose? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Okay. Thank you, council members. So, Thank Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, when you when Michelle moves that sequence around, it keeps everybody on their toes, you know, because yes. you never know when you're going to be called. Keeps us if all. I can, can, if I can, council, I might make a recommendation: is that when the chair calls for a roll call vote, you'll know then you should turn off your mute and be prepared because you may be the next one called for the roll. The way uh, the way it's going to be set up, so that might save some time yeah. rather than have to go reach for your mute button. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I just want to bring something to council's attention tonight. Um, sure. Emailed. A, a reminder that we are going to be come the November fifth meeting. We're going to be back at the Tampa Convention Center, but also tonight's hearings that will go forward to second reading. Tentatively, working with the clerk, have a date for second reads the morning of November 5th, which is your first meeting back at the convention center. And last week, I believe we um, had 15 so far, second reads scheduled for November 5th to come back in the morning. Um, and the reason I bring that to your attention is I believe at most there are another seven to be added tonight. So I just want to bring it to your attention that unless these seven are scheduled to another night, which would certainly delay it that much more, you will have 22 second reads on um, on November 5th in the morning. So I just want, and they, you know, as you know, they could go very quickly, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention so you, you're not surprised when you see it. So thank you. All right. Anything else, sir? No, that's it. Thank you. All right. We'll continue on to item number two. Councilman Goods, are you raising your hand? No, sir, but sure. I, I, maybe I uh, don't have an updated form here, but mine says that item two is be continued. Item number two? I don't, do I, do we, there's no continuance for item number two? No. Okay. All right. Item number three continuance and then four and five cannot be heard. That's all I have. All right. Uh, Mr. Manassi, go ahead, sir. Uh, everybody in. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, yes. You and the clerk's office did receive written comments on this item. Before we start, if you could pull the applicant up so that they can see the presentation. Don't we generally swear everybody mm -hmm. in at one time? Yes. Yeah. Where's the uh... I see. Okay, there they are. Please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. But Mr. Cohen just flashed off the screen. Yeah. All right. There there go. And I did say I do. Okay, good evening, Council. Cammy Corbett, 101 East Kennedy Boulevard, Suite 3700, with the law firm of Hill Ward and Henderson. And it's been my absolute privilege to be involved in this project. Uh, it's the redevelopment of the West Shore Mall. It's a trans. Oh, oh, sorry, you guys go first. Sorry. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Ryan Manassi with Planning and Development. Item number two is file number REZ 20-23. Um, the applicant is proposing to rezone the property at 250, 298, 347 West Shore Plaza, 4901, 4915 West Kennedy Boulevard, 525 North Austin Street, 4813 North D Street, 100 204 253, and 440 North West Shore Boulevard from PD Plan Development to PD. Um, I'd like to go to the Planning Commission for their report. And if you'd please return to me afterwards. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Members. David Hay with your Planning Commission staff. I have been sworn. We start tonight off in the West Shore uh, Planning District. Uh, also located within the West Shore Employment Center. That's the hash area. Uh, the subject site uh, is home to Hart's West Shore Plaza Transfer Center. So numerous transit routes uh, do connect to this subject site. 
The subject site is located within a level A evacuation zone. Uh, the closest public recreation facility is Charles B. Williams Park. That's located approximately 2,900 feet to the east of the subject site. And we're all familiar with the mall. Here's uh, the mall. We have Kennedy on the south, um, 275 on the north, West Shore. It's a very intensive area uh, for the city. Uh, probably it's the most intensive outside of uh, downtown. And then here we have the uh, future land use map. You could see the subject site in this kind of reddish color all down West Shore over down Kennedy is all that regional mixed use 100. That's the most intensive category outside of downtown Tampa. Uh, to the north in the gray is that uh, municipal airport compatibility category. Uh, that's to support uh, the operation of TIA. Uh, to the south, the yellow, that's the single family detached uh, representing the residential six category. And then as we move eastward from West Shore and the mall, it is residential 35 in the dark brown and then goes down to a residential 20 uh, for the remainder, the most of West Shore Palms. The applicant is requesting to rezone the approximately 54 acre West Shore Plaza site to allow for redevelopment of uh, the former Sears site and the current Bank of America and Seasons 52 buildings and associated uh, surface parking lots. The applicant is proposing a maximum of approximately 3.5 million square feet of a mixture of uses, including retail, multifamily, residential, hotel, and a number of additional uses. That square footage also includes a large segment of, of the existing mall. The proposed development provides for a 1.5 FAR, which is below the 3.5 that can be considered under that regional mixed use 100. Uh, the proposed site plan provides for an urban style development pattern with wide sidewalks, street trees, ground floor uses oriented to adjacent rights of way and structured parking internal and integrated into the development. A centrally located green space area is provided and Hart's West Shore Transfer Center continues to be located on the north side of the development providing for direct transit connections. The site plan also proposes with the assistance of the Florida Department of Transportation, the reconnecting of North Occident Street. This additional north-south connection will help reconnect areas north of Interstate 275 and re provide relief for West Shore Boulevard. The subject site is also located within the coastal high hazard area. As such, the applicant is required to work with the city of Tampa and other regulatory agencies to ensure any multifamily residential units mitigate for their impacts to shelter space. Uh, that's typically done through the permitting department. Overall, the proposed development is comparable and compatible with the existing development pattern found on in this portion of the West Shore Business Center. And it is consistent with the development pattern anticipated under the regional mixed use 100 future land use category. Based on those considerations, the Planning Commission staff does find that the planned development is consistent with the provisions of the Imagine 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Brian Manassi with Planning Development. Can I please share my screen? And if you would let me know when it comes up, you should see REZ 20-23. It's on the screen, Ryan. Thank you. Um, item number two again is file number REZ 20 23, and the applicant is proposing to rezone the property from PD, plan development, to PD to allow for retail sales, medical office, business and professional office, multifamily residential, hotel, restaurant, commercial recreation facility, vehicle repair, minor and major, bar or lounge, college and school uses. The property is generally located south of Interstate 275 and is bounded by West Kennedy Boulevard to the south. Uh, Northwest Shore Boulevard to the east and the northbound entry to the Veterans Expressway and Tampa International Airport to the west. Site is, the site is the existing West Shore Plaza Mall and the application proposes to redevelop the east side of the existing footprint of the new development on the eastern boundary of the overall site. The existing retail shopping mall will remain with the exception of the former Sears location. 
Um, the lot contains a total of 53.5 acres and the new uses uh, proposed will be developed along the eastern and southern pro uh, portions of the site. The applicant seeks to develop a mixed use urban scale project along with uh, along the Kennedy and West Shore Boulevard commercial corridors and the applicant proposes to integrate both commercial and residential uses on the site with phase development located to the east end of the site. Uh, the, develop, the development proposes four vehicular access points, uh, one on West Shore Boulevard within the project boundary, uh, with the existing vehicle, vehicular access points to remain on the south on West Kennedy Boulevard, and a total of three 12 story structures are proposed, uh, each, uh, each containing ground floor commercial uses incorporating commercial and residential uses above. Two additional 10 story structures are, uh, are proposed on the east side, east, I'm sorry, on the west side of the proposed project area in close proximity to the existing mall structure. The maximum building height proposed is 120 feet to 160 feet, which is subject to Hillsborough County Aviation Authority and Federal Aviation Authority approval. There are 11,479 parking spaces required and 9,757 spaces are being provided. Um, that there is a waiver being requested and that's 15% reduction in that parking. The site is located in the West Shore Overlay District and compliance with the district development standard, standards is required. The intent of the district is to provide character with form based uh, parameters to ensure compatible development within the district. The property is surrounded by commercial uses to the north, uh, that, that'd be north of Interstate 275 in the MAP3 and OP1 zoning districts commercial uses to the south in the PD and office professional OP dis, uh, zoning districts and commercial uses to the east in the PD and commercial CG zoning districts and then commercial uses to the west in the PD zoning district. On your screen and I left it up there a little bit longer was straight from your staff report as well. On page five it shows you the proposed building setbacks and it's labeled per building and then it goes to the north south east and west. The previously approved waivers, you see one through eight, that was from the previously approved PD, and then the proposed seven waivers through this request. The map, and I know David went into it a little bit, um, Interstate 275 to the north again, and here's the access as we're talking about to the Veterans Expressway and then Kennedy to the south and West Shore Boulevard to the east. So again, the subject parcels are hatched in green, but the, the portion of development is gonna be this Eastern portion uh, more or less where the CI is, is in white going straight north. Um, the aerial again shows any historic landmark structures, national or local within a thousand feet. Uh, the Tampania House is uh, a, a national landmark structure that is located within that thousand foot. And then the subject parcel again is outlined in the red dashed. A couple pages from the site plan and um, I know you have a 24 page packet site plan. Um, uh, this is page one showing the overall site and then again this proposed development. The six buildings that we were speaking of in the staff report is like there's one here, two, then it goes to three, four, fives over here, and then six to the southern portion. The waivers are shown there as well as the zoning notes. Um, the signage plan is included in this PD site plan. And then another page will show uh, some of the parking layouts for the mixed use buildings. And then I just provided a couple of pictures, mainly on the east side, just showing you that West Shore Boulevard, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, but that's just looking north and south. And then this is along Kennedy going east and then west to the right. And the development review and compliance staff has reviewed the application and finds the request inconsistent with the city of Tampa land development code. Please reference findings by the transportation department related to the parking waiver should it be the pleasure of city council to approve this application and the waivers identified in the staff report, there are modifications needed between first and second reading as outlined in your staff report on the revision sheet. Um, if it is approved, please include that revision sheet uh, corrections between first and second reading and planning transportation as well as natural resources staff are available for any questions that you may have. Do we have any questions? <coughs> All right. Hearing none, I believe we, uh, Councilman Dinkfelder. Yeah. I've got, I've got papers, I've got notebooks, everything's flying. Um, transportation staff, who, who do we have on board? Should be Jonathan Scott.
Do we have Jonathan Scott or anybody from transportation? And if you could uh, be sworn okay. in. It's Jonathan Scott, please uh, swear me in. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Hey, Jonathan. Um, how are you this evening? Very good, thank you. Good. So, um, obviously, this is a big project, um, an older, an older project. I remember when West Shore Plaza was was built, and it was very exciting to ride my bicycle up to West Shore Plaza and go to the movies. But anyway, um, complicated, uh, complicated issues. I assume, uh, and we'll hear more about this later. I get, I imagine this was a DRI in the beginning, um, the complicated transportation issues. So did, did you work closely with Mr. Cohn to wrestle with all these uh, potential transportation impacts um, in regard to this project? Did you have any concerns? Tell us about, tell us about this, because obviously there's a lot of, of uh, new residential units, first time residential I think has ever been introduced on this property. Um, so even though we've eliminated commercial traffic by eliminating the Sears, we've now added uh, residential. So, uh, yes, sir. Worked with uh, them on their traffic study and uh, all the different access management points, and I'm pleased with the outcome. They followed all of our uh, comments that we had, and um, I think it's going to be a good project. I didn't have any other concerns really. We just we just objected to their parking waiver. Otherwise, uh, as far as the uh, traffic study goes and so forth, they they met all the requirements. What what sort of comments did did transportation staff? What sort of traffic uh, comments did you guys have that they did they revise and address? Yeah, we had some comments on some other driveways and some other access points. And we worked all those issues out so it's a better easier to get in and out of the project for all the traffic and so forth so and how about the how about the total the total load on the adjacent uh kennedy boulevard and west shore uh boulevard uh how, how are they addressing those off-site off impacts yeah they, they provided the traffic study and uh had some mitigation that they'll have to pay as far as their impacts to those that they have met those requirements. Okay. So Kennedy and West Shore are already pretty darn busy uh, at rush hour, especially. Um, do you see this exacerbating that? I know those are busy intersections. I don't think this, the changes that they're going to do are, you don't really probably won't see too much of a difference, you know, from the, uh, overall traffic and it will increase a little bit, but it's uh, may not be that much more noticeable all said and done. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Absolutely. Any other questions from council members? All right. Hearing none, the petitioner. Oh, it's my turn. <laughs> Sorry. Cami Corbett, 101 East Kennedy Boulevard, Suite 3700 with the law firm Hill Ward Henderson. Excited to be part of this uh, transformative project. Um, and in the interest of time, I'd like to turn it over to our land use and transportation expert, Randy Cohen, who you're all familiar with, who both lives in West Shore, on West Shore Boulevard, and is very involved in the West Shore Alliance. And with that, Randy, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Randy Cohen, 4121 West Cypress Street. I have been sworn, and if I could share my screen, I can start the PowerPoint. Randy, should we refer to you as the dude? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Uh, is everyone able to see, see my screen yet? Yes. Yes, sir, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I am really looking forward to this presentation. Um, everyone knows West Shore Plaza. It was actually constructed in 1967. So Mr. Dingfelder has dated himself a little bit here. Um, this actually predated DRIs in Florida. However, this project is one of the original parcels within the West Shore area-wide DRI that was approved in 1985. And all of the uses and amounts in this particular 
rezoning were approved in that DRI, both addressed and approved as needed. The zoning actually has dealt with all of the on-site issues, zoning consistencies, et cetera, and we spent an awful lot of time with Jonathan Scott dealing with transportation in the area of the mall as a result of this. Uh, wanted to let you know one thing, this project is certainly paying its appropriate share for transportation in the area. Our total fees to be paid by the developer are $6,933,929.55, so basically $7 million. I uh, want to really deal with what we have going on here. I'll start with the aerial on the left. See the Sears Auto Center, that is going away. That's in front of the existing parking garage here. The Sears building itself is going away. Seasons 52 is going away, but hopefully will be one of the restaurateurs within the new development of the project and the Bank of America building down at the corner of Kennedy and West Shore is also going away. On the right side, we're basically showing three phases of development. This is not an orderly phasing. It could be any one of these areas. It could be all of them at one time. We've simply broken them up into three blocks uh, for the purposes of assessment and discussing them. This is the proposed planning map we started with. What we're wanting to do with this project is take it away from being a mall with huge parking lots and a mall that everything happens inside and nothing happens outside. We've created the street grid, taken Occident, which is actually a public road to here. It's private from here on up all the way through the project. And then the Florida Department of Transportation will be extending Occident up to Cyprus. Very important that this is where the heart transit facility is, it will be substantially enhanced by this project and by the connection up to Cypress of Occident. We have Gray Street, which is actually a public road up until about this point, then it is private. We have North B, which is a private street from West Shore Boulevard, will come over and connect to Occident. And North A, which again is a private street connecting West Shore over to Occident. Important thing to realize is that all of these private streets Washington Prime, the applicant, has agreed that they will develop them to the criteria that is required in the West Shore overlay, even though they're private streets. So not only are we complying with the overlay regarding West Shore Boulevard and Kennedy Boulevard, but all of our internal streets will also be addressing that particular criteria. Move on to the next slide. This is actually the what we'll call the master plan of the development area. I have flipped this, so north is to the right. West Shore Boulevard is along the bottom of the page. Kennedy Boulevard is over here uh, on the left-hand side of the page. Want to start up at the top. This is the Hart facility and the Occident connection over to Cyprus. This is where the auto care facility for Sears uh, currently exists, at least the building itself. It will be removed. This will be a mixed-use building, primarily medical office with opportunities for retail and restaurant. This area is where Sears currently exists, the retail store itself. It will be a hotel with restaurant and retail opportunities on the first floor. And we'll continue to have an entrance into the mall, basically exactly where it exists today when you walk from Sears into the mall itself. Adjacent to the hotel, we have a large green open space. Moving over, this is a small expansion to the current restaurants that exist there, P.F. Chang, Magianos, et cetera. Moving down to the south, this is actually where Bank of America sets up the corner. This is a mixed use building, office primarily in this area, residential in this area above the parking structure. And this is a mixed use portion of the building, retail, restaurant, office, uh, whatever the market desires for that area. Uh, we do have interfaces on all sides of the building with the street, the sidewalks. We do not turn our back to anything, whether it be an internal street or an external street. Next block over, this is where Seasons 52 currently exists today. This will primarily be a residential development with mixed use retail and office on a major courtyard that we have across the street from the green street, across from the green space, I'm sorry. Uh, well, you see this uh, lavender color or purple color. This is restaurant and retail opportunities that face the streets, whether it be North B, West Shore, or North A. 
Moving to the final development block. This is an interesting block, residential above the parking structure. We have on the ground floor in this area, a specialty grocer. Above it is office space. The entire first floor is ringed with retail and restaurant uses. So as you can see, on every face of every street, we have interaction with the sidewalk, with the street, et cetera. Moving on to the next one. Oh, need to talk about height moment. We've taken cues from our neighbors, which is the 500 Northwest Shore building to the north and Urban Center to the south. We're basically maintaining that feel and look along West Shore Boulevard. Of course, incorporating all the West Shore overlay criteria along West Shore Boulevard itself. Next slide, same idea, but here we're beginning to show you the architecture and what's going on. This would be the office, this would be residential. This, of course, is West Shore Boulevard moving up toward the existing 500 West Shore. Here's some uh, really nice renderings. This is at the corner of Kennedy and West Shore, West Shore Boulevard going to the north here, Kennedy Boulevard going to the left over here. Um, this is the office building. This is the residential building. Even though these are large blocks of building, we do a good job, I believe, of separating the buildings and not making them seem as large as they actually are. And again, you can see the interface with the street. Moving to the next, this is actually North B. This on the left would be where Seasons 52 currently exists. This would be uh, to the north side of that, that's simply a parking lot. You'd have P.F. Chang's and Maggiano's, et cetera, down at the end of North B here. This is office that's above the grocery store that's over in this area. We again have retail and restaurant along West Shore Boulevard, as well as all of the other street fronts of this particular block and residential above. I will tell you that the residential units all have their own private recreation and open space on the top of the garage. Their top floors are green with pools and various amenities involved. This is probably my favorite picture. We are looking north across Occident. Showed you where that large plaza was. This is where it actually exists with the restaurants and retail on this side. To this point are the large green areas we have adjacent to the hotel. Down from the hotel, you can see the medical office that we're proposing. You can also see the residential that's on that block to the north. Now, I'll talk about waivers for a moment. We have a lot of them, uh, but they're basically broken up into three categories. Previously approved waivers, there are eight of those. Then we have some previously approved waivers that we've had to modify. There are four of those, and then we have three new waivers, and I'll go through each of those because that's something that we must do in this particular presentation. This is the criteria that's used to determine whether waivers are appropriate. We certainly believe that all of the waivers we're gonna discuss are appropriate. Uh, these are the previously approved waivers. Basically what we have here, waiver one is an acknowledgement that the project in the past was permitted to provide some of its tree and landscaping requirements on the adjacent public right of way. We wanna make sure that's acknowledged. Second waiver is uh, that we are exempting the existing mall from the West Shore overlay because it predates it. Uh, we are not exempting any of the new development within the project, simply the existing mall itself. There's no way that we could bring it up to the street. Third waiver, again, for the existing mall, a parking lot does not have the landscape islands in it that one would normally see today. So we want to acknowledge and recognize that that is a waiver, but it's consistent with the existing development pattern and approved in the past. Fourth waiver are for all of the existing compactors and dumpsters. There are a number of them on the site. However, they do not necessarily meet the screening that's required in the code today, but we're asking for a waiver so that in fact they can remain as they exist. Next waiver we have are buffers. They vary in from eight feet to zero feet. These are existing buffers that were approved. We simply want to acknowledge that they remain consistent in a part of the pro project. Uh, we have wall signs that are approved for the north side of the parking garage that faces I-275. They're there today. We need a waiver to make sure they stay there. We're not asking for any more signs or any additional square footage, just recognition of the previous approval. We also have a pylon sign <clears throat> adjacent to I-275 for West Shore Plaza. It intends to remain in place 
We simply want to acknowledge that in fact, it's there, it's approved and it will remain. We also have uh, the approvals for uh, sign along Memorial Highway, which has not been in place, but we want to preserve that particular previous approval. Modified waivers. These are waivers that exist, but we're having to change them around. Placement of building signs. We're adding new buildings, so we have to modify the waiver to accommodate those new buildings. We do have a parking waiver in the past. We're increasing it to 15%. This is a very significant mixed use project. A uh, substantial amount of residential, substantial amount of office, substantial amount of retail. They all have different peaking characteristics, and this is a very appropriate and applicable um, parking reduction for this type of mixed use. Unfortunately, city code currently does not recognize mixed use projects from a parking standpoint. Uh, next one we have here is a waiver of the sign requirements. Uh, approval of all signs. What we have is a total of 9,200 square feet of signs approved. The reason we have this as a to be modified waiver is that of course we have new buildings with new sign locations, which we have shown, but we need to modify the waiver to address that. Finally, uh, the last of the previously approved waivers are loading bursts. Uh, there are shared loading bursts within the mall so that the individual buildings do not comply with the number of loading bursts that are necessary, but the project has uh, very well functioned. Here is our new waiver, only three of them. One is to allow the sign area on buildings to be on all facades. You might ask, well, why are we doing that? We have a number of internal pri private streets. Signs are not allowed on those buildings on those street frontages since they're not recognized as street frontages since they are private. We're simply uh, asking to allow to distribute those signs on all the signs of the building that have either private or public street frontage so we can keep those streets looking and feeling like they're public streets even though they're private. Next one is two hazardous trees, two non-hazardous grand trees. These two trees exist adjacent to the Sears Auto Care Center. We've tried to, to retain them, but there's no way. Reason being that with the new FEMA requirements on floodplain elevation, we will have a minimum of four and a half feet of fill over virtually the entire new development area of the site. As a result, to keep these trees, they end up being in tree wells that are four and a half to five foot deep. They will not survive. I know Natural Resources has actually uh, agreed with us on that but we need to address that waiver. And I'm sorry about that, I just hit a button I should not have hit. Let's go on to the next one, facts in support of the approval. This is part of the existing West Shore area-wide DRI. We have no organizations that we have objections from. Uh, we have seen that uh, today we had an objection from uh, one of the particular folks on the east side of West Shore Boulevard and we will address that at the appropriate time. We're consistent with all of the agencies and reviews from the city of Tampa, except for the parking waiver out of transportation. Substantial competent evidence, I believe, has been supported to justify all of the waivers and to demonstrate that we've uh, satisfied all the criteria within the PD. Finally, the Planning Commission has uh, considered this appropriate. I do remember at this point that one waiver that I didn't fully explain. We have only one waiver from the West Shore overlay in this entire development. And that is taking a setback from 10 feet to zero feet along Kennedy Boulevard. The DOT has a 20 by 20 uh, parcel of land they own where they have a sign. Uh, we're requesting zero setback for that 20 feet. So we have a consistent building face along Kennedy Boulevard. And I believe we certainly address and maintain the nature and spirit of the overlay, although we're asking for that one minor um, waiver from the overlay itself. And with that, I'll wrap it up. We are moving this from a mall to a true mixed use development that is live, work, play. We're consistent with the West Shore overlay, except for that one item we discussed in a waiver. This is certainly a very walkable mixed use facility. You can work here, you can live here, you can play here, you can shop here, you can get your groceries here and you can actually take a bus from here because we have a transit center. We also, by the way, have a very extensive um, drop off and pickup area for valet, for Uber, Lyft, et cetera, in the center of the project near the green space. And with that, I will turn it back over to Cammie.
Thank you, Randy. Um, Council, that concludes our presentation and we're available to answer any questions you might have. Do we have any questions from council members before we go to public comment? Councilman Dinkfelder. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Randy. Um, Randy, just for the record, because uh, Mr. Shelby likes to make sure there's a good record, even sure. though even though we know you, you might want to give us uh, your credentials since you sure. testified. I'm a professional planner, AICP, for 20 some years. I've been involved in projects in Tampa since the early 1970s. I've done more than 70 DRIs across the state of Florida. One of my specialty areas, in fact, are DRIs. I've done more than 20 DRIs for malls across the state of Florida, mall amendments and DRIs themselves. I have started my career out doing transportation and traffic signal design. So I have a very strong background in transportation as well that qualifies me to do the transportation analyses associated with these projects. And I will tell you more importantly, the developer of a mall, the last thing they want to see is a traffic problem in front of their site. I wouldn't be doing this for a living if I didn't do it well enough to satisfy their demands, which frankly are, are greater than the city of Tampa's demands in this particular case. So a couple of, thank you. So a couple of questions. Um, you might have, somebody might have said it, uh, maybe staff said it, or somebody might have said it along the lines, but refresh my memory. How many residential, new residential units? Well, it's all new when it comes to residential. <laughs> it's all new. The maximum number we requested is 1,765 units spread out over the three major blocks. And what, um, in, a, in an ideal world, what sort of phasing are we looking at in terms of, uh, you know, is this, this a decade long project or? Um, it, it very well could be. This is certainly something that would be extremely unusual if it were all developed at the same time. So the most likely scenario is it will be developed over a period of time. I think we'll see the, if you will, the northernmost block is a very large block, so it could even be developed um, in sections, if you will. The other two blocks would be likely to develop at one time. Um, there always is a possibility that it could be all developed together. It would be a great thing for that to happen, but um, it would be exceedingly unusual. Okay. You mentioned that you wanted to exempt the remainder of the west side of the property uh, from the requirements of the West Shore District. Yes, sir. Uh, which is uh, it's understandable because obviously you're not doing anything with those buildings uh, like Dick's and, and and Macy's and that sort of thing at, and Penny's at this time. But, um, but down the road, if you came back, um, and said, wow, the East side has been such a success. We're going to level the whole mall and do the same thing on the West side. And th maybe this isn't really a question for you or as, as much as it is for Kate, but does your, would your exemption carry through to the west side uh, and therefore you'd be exempted from the west shore overlay for that redevelopment of the west side this is kate wells if you're asking me that question the exemption would be limited uh to how it's shown on the site plan that is before you this evening yeah, so and from from my perception we've asked for flexibility on the eastern side where we have the development going we've not asked for that flexibility on the west side so if we were to do substantial changes on the west side that did not conform to city criteria as a non-substantial change then we'd be rezoning the property and at that point i think it would be uh, a very different issue as to whether that particular waiver from the overlay would remain or not. I personally would hope it would not because I have a great deal of faith in the overlay. All right, Ms. Corbett, do you have a, an opinion on that or an, an assertion? It's uh, uh, the, the waiver language does say it's for existing development only. Okay. So that would be existing development. And so I, believe, right. I concur with Ms. Wells and, and Mr. Cohen with respect to the application of that. Okay, I, I think that's an important uh, issue. Um, in regard to the signage, um, I've, I've, I've seen the, the big signs that you can see from the interstate. Um, I can't recall if they're currently digital or not. Um, is it, have you all 
are they? And, and if not, have you all addressed uh, digital or not? Well, there is one existing billboard on the property that's adjacent to I-275 and it's separately controlled by the city of Tampa and their sign ordinance regarding billboards, as well as the fact that I would suspect there may be some purview from the Florida Department of Transportation on that billboard as well, since it's adjacent to the interstate. How about the others? You said there were four billboards, I think, on that uh, side. The, the four, there are four signs that are permitted on the north side of the existing parking structure that faces I-275. They are not billboards. They are simply signs that are attached to the parking structure and have been changed out from time to time. They also have sign limitations. They are uh, by no means anything near the size of the billboard. So going to my question, I believe the code allows uh, private signs like that, uh, advertising businesses to convert over to digital. Uh, I'm, and not, I'm not talking about the billboard code, I'm talking about the regular, the regular code. And, as well as you can correct me or Mr. Shelby if I'm wrong. So I guess my question is, is, is Ms. Wells perhaps, is there potential for those very large signs to all be digital um, because they fall outside of the billboard code? And, um, and did your PD application address this, Ms. Corbett? It did not specifically address it to my knowledge, Mr. Cohen, you were most intimately involved. This has been a two year long process in terms of how the plan has evolved. And so I think I'd like to defer to him. Yeah, if I will, we have an alternative sign plan. The alternative sign plan does not seek any digital signs. Um, whatever would be allowed under code that was both consistent with our alternative sign plan and so the Tampa sign code would likely be permissible. These particular signs, I believe, are regulated to the point where they are basically, and I'm going from memory, but I believe the four signs on this parking structure are something like 12 feet by 16 or 18 feet maximum size. So they are relatively small signs when you compare them to a billboard. They're about an eighth of the size, if you will. And they can only advertise on-site uses. Okay. Um, and how about the trees? Um, I, I looked in the staff report. I didn't see the, a tree report included. Did somebody, Mr. Manassi, did you say we had tree staff standing by? We should have Bill Bohr, sir. He could be brought in. Uh, no, Bill Bohr needs to be brought in. They're trying to share my screen. And Randy, when when I mention the dude, you know I say it with love. <laughs> I took it as a compliment. Lewis, obviously, I'm the big Lebowski reference there. <laughs> if you want, while we're waiting for Bill, I can give you a little back on those trees. Yeah, I, I, well, if you if you have some photographs or or, or um, any kind of uh, ability to show us, you know, I hear what you're saying about, you know, that they'd be surrounded and, and in, a, in a deep well and that sort of thing, but I, I, a picture is worth a thousand words, I guess. I, I do not have any pictures. I will tell you that the trees have tolerated where they are located today. They actually have about a foot or so of uh, depression that they sit in because even when the Sears Auto Care Center was built, the elevations were raised and they were able to, to lessen that tree well by making it a very large area. But they, they start out sitting as much as a foot below the surrounding grade. And when we add four and a half feet of fill to the property, then of course it becomes a totally intolerable situation. I know that uh, Bill had extensive conversations with our arborist, Ricky Pederica, uh, regarding these trees and they came to the conclusion there was just simply no feasible way for these trees to remain on the site. Okay. Well, if we're having trouble getting Bill up, um, my last question, uh, Mr. Cohn and Ms.
Corbett is um, you're adjacent to at least two neighborhood associations, one of the oldest. Yeah, in the I'm trying to, oh, here, here it goes, here it goes. All right. Uh, the idol's working and uh, they need to pull me in for the picture. This is Bill Boers. Sorry, we're trying to we're trying to get him on for you, gentlemen. All right, okay. please be sworn in when you're on camera. All right. Well, we can wait. Whenever you come up, Bill, we'll we'll get we'll get you. But my last question to you, Mr. Cohn, was to Ms. Corbett was um, neighborhood associations. Uh, I imagine right. you probably went out and made presentation. There's Mr. Gordon. There he uh, is. I'll swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, yes. Thank you. Um, what was your specific question again? I'm just trying to get at it. Well, Mr. Cohn, Mr. Cohn asserted that you guys have had long conversations about these two grand, grand trees. Um, and because of the surrounding fill, he said that, uh, well, I don't know. I don't want to say what he said. You tell, you tell us. OK. Um, yeah, there are two grand trees on the site. They're outside the, uh, the Sears Auto Center, and they're live oaks, um, species. Uh, but uh, I've been in discussions with, depending who I talk to, anywhere from three to four and a half feet of fill. And uh, these trees are literally the trunks are about ten feet apart, and so they're two grand oaks with partial canopies that make up one tree. Um, that's something that I would take extraordinary methods to preserve. If we did tree wells, uh, my experience with tree wells is um, after a while they stop draining. The drains clog up, uh, tree debris falls in the drainage areas, and sediment builds up. And then once they clog up, um, the area floods and the trees die. Um, alternatively, if you're to put three or four and a half feet of soil around them, you'll literally stop them out. You'll run out the root system. Um, it won't have the uh, the air exchange any longer. So uh, in this case, the strongest case for this is to cut them at the base and start out with new age class of trees at the higher elevation. There was a comprehensive um, plan done by Ricky Paterica, uh on these two trees, and his findings are the same. Uh, finds that each tree would be in conflict with the proposed finished grade and I was recommending removal and uh, he's a tree guy just as much as I am both certified arborists uh -huh. so in conclusion it's, it's better off all the way around to to start a new age class of trees and mitigate for these trees okay um and then my last question Mr. Cohn is Corbett about neighborhoods yes we we uh did I shouldn't say we, I did not personally meet with the neighborhood association, the association, the lawyer that was handling the case with Mr. Cohen prior to me joining Hillboard Henderson met personally with uh, West Shore Palms on site, I believe. I'll let Randy speak yes. as to who they met with, but just to, to know we've reached out to them and noticed them and, you know, we've not received any objection from them. And the feedback we've gotten is that whatever changes were made has satisfied any concerns they had. But go ahead, Mr. Cohen. Uh, we actually had uh, meetings at the mall with both those neighborhood associations. Uh, I believe we had two separate meetings with them, with them jointly there together, went over the entire project, et cetera. And I know Cami has reached out to them subsequent to the COVID issue where we really can't meet with neighbors that, that well and found that neither of those organizations offered letters of objection to this particular project. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Any other council members have questions at this time? Hearing none, do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on this item? Chair, yes, we do. And I'm going to bring them over now. Okay. How many people do we have? Just one. Okay. Thank you. All right, the speaker is Tim McGothy. There you go. Please uh, raise your hand to swear you in. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Council. 
My name is Tim Gay. I live at 211 South Manhattan Avenue, and I'm representing the Beach Park Homeowners Association, which is to the south of the project across Kennedy. Uh, that's the yellow area that Mr. Hay had on his uh, diagram number two. Uh, so there's approximately 1,200 residences in Beach Park. Um, so these span across both the east and the west sides of West Shore from Lois all the way over to the water on Tampa Bay. Uh, first of all, I want to say we're generally supportive of the project. Uh, we think it's a great urban design. We have no objection to the waivers that are being sought. Uh, we do have two areas of concern in the rezoning as they relate to Chapter 27, Section 136 of the Municipal Code. The first one is the traffic analysis uh, that uh, Mr. Dingfelder had mentioned. Uh, the, now, the traffic analysis, I'll, I'll first mention, is about 400 pages, so there's a lot to go through. Um, there's also some inconsistencies in, the, in some of the numbers that seem to be as a result of adjusting for the publics. Uh, but it appears that the area that affects the neighborhood, which is West Shore Boulevard, uh, south of Kennedy, uh, just that part alone would have about 150% more southbound traffic and 93% more northbound traffic as a result of the project. And that depends on uh, which time of the day you're talking about, whether it's the AM or the PM commute. Uh, so we are concerned that the traffic is an adverse impact to our neighborhood uh, since West Shore runs right through it. And the, uh, the large increase uh, appears to be at odds with Chapter 27, Section 136, elements one and five of the municipal code. Uh, so that would be our first concern. The second one is it relates to the school capacity. This, uh, this project has the same districting as Beach Park. The schools in the district in normal times, obviously, are already overutilized. Uh, we know that there's a lot of constraints on the school system, the budget, et cetera. Uh, there was a adequate facilities analysis done for this project. It indicates that that trend would continue. Uh, Grady Elementary alone is forecasted to have a 46% increase in utilization as a result of this project. Uh, so again, school overutilization uh, seems to be an adverse impact to the nearby neighborhoods. And in the 2040 comprehensive plan, the public school facilities objective 2.3 indicates that the city shall manage approvals to ensure that adequate capacity is available. Uh, so based on the comprehensive plan, the municipal code, we believe that uh, mitigations for those two items are crucial to address. Um, again, I did review the, uh, the, the plans and everything else. Uh, I mentioned the inconsistency in the traffic. Uh, the other thing I did see is that uh, transportation indicated that bike racks should be present in all the buildings. Uh, the plans don't show any bike racks in building six. And uh, finally, the other thing I'd like to add is that this overall uh, increase in traffic, you know, again, somewhere between three to 6% just overall traffic on, on West Shore South of Kennedy, doesn't account for any of the projects that are on the opposite end of, of West Shore that are also coming forth to uh, the council. So with that, that concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that the only uh, live speaker that we had that had registered? Yes, sir, that was it. Do we have anybody at the Tampa Convention Center that wishes to speak on this item? This is Eileen Rosario from Planning and Development, and there's no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have, there, have any other questions or comments from council members? Council member Goods, before we go to rebuttal for the applicant. I, I, I just was hearing the gentleman talking about the 46% increase in the number of possible students in the local area schools. Has the petitioner looked into that or? have any feedback from the school district in reference to what the gentleman is talking about or, or has not, not, not been discussed? Okay. Mr. I, I can, I can, I just, is it, is it appropriate for me to take that now? The school concurrency is evaluated at the time of your site plan approval or your plat approval. So it, you would, it would be inappropriate at zoning to deny a rezoning because of school concurrency, because you never know in this a certain shot snapshot in time whether there's going to be capacity. And so as Randy testified earlier, there's going to likely this will come in phases. And if the project cannot satisfy concurrent school concurrency at the time that it's permitted or it goes in for permitting at a site plan, the site plan won't be approved and it won't be able to proceed. Um, some of the overcapacity with the school board has been dealt with through proportionate share mitigation agreements. Uh, those are a tool or that are available that if at the time of site permitting, 
uh, there is not uh, adequate school capacity that they can enter into an agreement with the school board to provide additional payments of fees up front to make that capacity become available. And then uh, Randy, if you could address the transportation and, and go into a little bit more detail on the DRI, the details of the DRI, the fact that these uses are already approved as part of the DRI and what the DRI process involves. Yes. Um, and first and foremost, this project is a part of the West Shore area by DRI. So transportation has been dealt with at numerous times through the DRI itself and assessed impacts on things like West Shore Boulevard to the south of Kennedy. Uh, what I would say as well, um, I'm sure the gentleman has done a great job of going through 400 pages of transportation analysis. What I suspect he is actually quoting is as we did this analysis, we did an existing condition that included the existing mall and all the development on the mall. I am very sorry. I was muted and didn't realize it. Um, West Shore Area Wide DRI has addressed all of the regional and significant impacts of this project, uh, especially those of West Shore Boulevard south of the site. For our rezoning traffic study, we were required to use all projects, include all projects approved but not yet built. At the time we started this project, Publix is one of the projects that had not been built. We included that in the analysis as well. A part of this analysis, because we had an existing mall that was so much of existing traffic, is that we removed the mall traffic. And so our future year shows project traffic being the total traffic of the existing mall plus the proposed development. So uh, while the, the gentleman speaking, I think did a pretty good job of wading through 400 pages, I suspect the numbers that he are quoting are greatly exaggerated because they include not only the proposed development, but also all of the traffic ever associated with West Shore Plaza itself. All right, any other questions or comments? And I would just add, you know, it's unfortunate if we had heard from the gentleman ahead of time, we would have been able to have some of the conversation and had some clarification. Um, okay. Can I just ask one real fast? Councilman Carlson, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I think you mentioned this earlier, forgive me if you didn't, but um, that DOT, DOT was planning to open Rio Street. And it, it if, if you did mention that, how much traffic do you think that will take away from um, West Shore that could alleviate some of the traffic problems? I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. I've been involved in uh, the interstate program on behalf of West Shore Alliance, the complete streets project that was completed by the city of Tampa, the modeling that was done in that complete streets project showed that the traffic on West Shore Boulevard could reduce from anywhere from 10 to 20% as a result of the Rio interchange being uh, connected to the interstate itself and would have about 50% less or five to 10% reduction on Kennedy Boulevard in front of the site as well. So that particular improvement of the Rio interchange is probably the most significant improvement in West Shore that changes traffic on Kennedy Boulevard and West Shore Boulevard. We had taken that into account as well in our analysis as instructed by uh, the city during the methodology process for the traffic study. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilman Dingfelder. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cohn, um, it was rather eye-opening when the gentleman from Beach Park um, talked about 45% some you know increase in certain peak hours or that sort of thing. But if that's not and 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 I, I don't I don't have the benefit of the of the traffic report. I guess it's probably been provided as an exhibit. Um, is that is that true? So I I believe the number is substantially less than that. I believe he was quoting the if you will net entire mall traffic, including right. the 
Well, right. well, well, now, I understand what your response was, but my question is, if that's not accurate, then what is the increase? What is the increased uh, traffic in the immediate immediate area of along Kennedy and immediate area along along West Shore? Um, I'd have to, to pull out the traffic study. I'm happy to do that. I think the numbers actually West Shore Boulevard to the north of Kennedy is an increase of ironically about 20% about the number that's reduced by Rio Kennedy Boulevard. It is about 10 to 15%. I can tell you that West Shore or south of Kennedy has substantially less traffic than was indicated. I happen to live on West Shore Boulevard just south of Kennedy, and I can assure you uh, there is not a 20 to 40 percent increase in traffic on West Shore Boulevard as a result of this particular approval or shown to be that in the traffic study. And maybe one of these days we'll three lane all of West Shore. <laughs> We've had many discussions about that. All right. Thank you, Randy. Anything else? Have you had your enough uh, rebuttal applicants? Uh, yes, I think we've adequately addressed both the uh, issues raised by the council and by the gentleman in terms of school concurrency and transportation. I don't, you know, I appreciate his effort and his involvement. I mean, it takes a lot to be involved in an association and to represent people and take your time to, to speak to city council. We do appreciate that, but I do think, um, he probably misread the traffic study and again school concurrency gets addressed at the time of site development and so with that we'd respectfully request your approval all right and before i ask for a motion to close i just want to wrap up with um with a few comments westford plaza has been there since 1967 and in the last several years i don't want to call it a dead mall or a dead property but we've seen significant changes i think when uh International Plaza was built. You had one of the anchor stores, Dillard's, move over there. Uh, then you had Sears, which Sears uh, has had some financial struggles. That location has closed. Um, 20 years ago, you saw uh, a major redevelopment in the mall when they added the movie theater and the restaurants to try and revitalize and uh, keep that mall up to date. But being that it's 53 years old, um, we have to think about, look at the mall now. It's not as busy as it was at peak time. So let's consider how busy it used to be when the anchor stores were, were all filled, when, when the vacancies were more filled, when you didn't have so much competition like you do in other, uh, with other shopping centers before International Plaza was built and whatnot. So when we talk about increase in traffic and the mall is not serving right now at its full capacity as it, as it was, or it's not serving at the capacity when it was at its, at its peak. So it'll basically take it back to possibly what it used to be traffic wise and, and population wise with people on the property, on and off the property. Um, having said that, I think uh, Councilman Dingfelder asked plenty of detailed questions. Um, the applicants answered uh, those questions. We've seen uh, waivers and whatnot uh, and uh, the justification behind them. So having said that, I'll stop. Can I get Councilman Dingfelder? I was gonna offer to read the ordinance. Oh, can I get a motion to close the public hearing? One more to close the hearing, Mr. Chairman. Motion to close second. from Councilman Miranda, second from Councilman Carlson. Any objection? Hearing no objection without a, by unanimous consent, the hearing is now closed. Councilman Dingfeld, if you'd like to read the substitute uh, ordinance being presented. I, I will, and and um, and I'll preface my, my reading um, with some similar comments. Um, we've all noticed, um, you know, the... Uh, it, with with sadness, you know that malls all across uh, the the area and all across the country uh, are hurting. Um, I'm I'm actually very excited that uh, this mall and this property is being rebuilt uh, with a a very exciting design and in a mixed use fashion, a true mixed use fashion. It kind of reminds me of uh, of the Midtown project, uh, but probably even bigger um, if that's possible. Um, so anyway, I'm excited about it. Um, like like uh, somebody pointed out, Mr. Cohen says I'm dating myself. Uh, I guess I was nine or ten years old when when they opened it up, and uh, and now hopefully I'll live to see the uh, the, re, the rebuilding of this project. So I'll move the uh, regard to REZ 20-23. I'll move a substitute substitute ordinance for first reading, an ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 250. 298 and 347 West Shore Plaza 
4901 and 4915 West Kennedy Boulevard, 525 North Occident Street, 4813 North B Street, and 100 204 253 and 440 North West Shore Boulevard in the city of Tampa, Florida, and were particularly described in section one from zoning district classifications PD, plan development, all CG uses, excluding outside storage and display, to PD, plan development, retail, medical office, business, professional office, resident, residential, multifamily, hotel, restaurant, commercial, recreational, facility, vehicle repair, minor and major, bar or lounge, college, school, providing an effective date. And I will say that I will miss the Seasons 52 because that's a nice restaurant, but hopefully they'll rebuild on the property. Thank you. Mr. Hi, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, may I add to that? Thank you. Councilman Miranda, then Mr. Shelby, and Mr. Manassi. This file number RZ20-23 uh, meets the Planning Commission staff uh, recommendation is consistent and that the waivers uh, are uh, those and objectives of the comprehensive plan and noted by the planning commission staff. The proposed uh, zoning district would allow for development that is comparable to the character and surrounding use is consistent with the development uh, pattern uh, anticipated under the current use plan design and that the proposed uh, zoning category is consistent and compatible with the existing development pattern in the surrounding area. Well, I'll accept uh, Mr. Miranda's comments as a friendly amendment to my motion. Thank you, Mr. Miranda. Mr. Shelby. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, also, to in please include the revision sheet uh, as provided by staff for revisions between first and second reading. Also, include the revision sheet. Thank you. And just a reminder, Council, uh, and I, I want to thank uh, Councilman Miranda for um, that addendum. Um, that is something that I ask that council has in front of them uh, when they do make their motions because that, as the law has uh, tightened, there are certain requirements and one of them is both on approvals and denials. You have to state your basis for your decision. So I would ask council members to please be mindful of that, remember that and have that language accessible to you. So again, I thank Mr. Miranda. And if I may, before uh, we vote, let me also add the waivers. Uh, with section 27-1394, uh, the design of the proposed development is unique and therefore is in need of waivers, A and B. The requested waivers will not substantially interfere with the injured or the rights of others whose property may be affected by the waiver. All right. We have a motion from Councilman Dingfelder. Councilman Miranda, you have the second? Yes, sir. All right, if we can have a roll call vote, please. Carlson? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Petro? Yes. Goods? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Dingfelder? Yes. And Vieira? 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 Motion carried with Vieira being absent of vote. Second reading and adoption will be held on November 5th at 9.30 a.m. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have item number six. <clears throat> Please raise your right hand to be sworn in uh, while we load everybody up on the screen. Yes, I do. Is there a petitioner on this? Yes, I have Mr. Fred Henry and Kevin Robles. They're here. They just need to unmute themselves and turn on their cameras. And somebody looks like they have the camera covered, perhaps. Mr. Robles, you need to uncover your camera and turn it on. We have to see your face. Same goes with uh, Mr. Henry, if he's going to be uh, speaking and testifying. or. Mr. Robles, uh, there you are. Okay, we need to. If 
Please adjust. We can't see your face. There we a little more. There we go. And uh, if you're muted, please unmute yourself. Is Mr. Henry going to be joining you? Uh, yeah, he's in the background. He's not going to be on the camera. Okay. All right, well, raise your hand. They're going to swear you in, everybody. Mr. Robles, hey, everybody. Please swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I will. Yes. Thank you. And the clerk's office did receive any comments on this item. Okay, and uh, do we have live speakers registered as well? Yes, yes. we have two okay. registered. All right, when we get there, we get there. All right, if you'd like to begin. Mary San Diego Planning Design and Development Coordination. Item number six is REZ 2069. It's a rezoning request for the property located at 210 North McDill Avenue from RS50 to plan development for a um, model dwelling unit and a detached single family residential. I defer to David Hay, the Planning Commission. Good evening, Council Members. David Hay with your Planning Commission staff. I have been we move eastward into the central uh, Tampa planning district uh, for this next case. It is also located within the Oakford Park uh, neighborhood. Uh, the closest uh, transit is located about 600 feet to the south along Kennedy Boulevard, which is a designated transit emphasis corridor. Uh, the site is located within an evacuation zone. And the closest public recreational facility is Vila Brothers Park, which is located approximately 3,200 feet to the northeast of the subject site. Here we have um, an aerial of the subject site. You could see the, the subject site is here right on uh, McDill Avenue, uh, just north of North A Street. Um, the pattern basically above North A is predominantly single family detached. Uh, south of North A, it's commercial centered along uh, Kennedy Boulevard. Uh, this is the Fox 13 uh, studios right here to the left. Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna to ask to interrupt for a minute if I may, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I've been informed that Councilman Vieira was uh, locked out of um, his uh, computer. He's in the process of logging in. He's listening to the meeting, but I don't know whether he has video access. And if he's able to, um, uh, if, if staff is able to assist him getting up and running, that'll be great. But I just wanted to let you know that um, uh, he's not in a position to be able to, um, uh, to be on screen, although he is listening and we'll see how soon he's able to get back. So thank you. Thank you very much, sir. All right, continue, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Um, here we have the future land use map. You could see the subject site and all the properties around it in that tan color are that residential 10 future land use category. Uh, if you move south down McDill toward North A, this uh, toward Kennedy and, and North A, this uh, light pink color is the, actually the UMU 60 future land use category, while these brown areas are the residential 20. Then you've got some community mixed use 35 further down um, McDill Avenue. Uh, the applicant is requesting to rezone from the residential single family 50 zoning district to a plan development to allow for the following two development options. Uh, one option is two single family detached residential units, while the uh, second option is uh, one single family detached residential model home with a sales office. Uh, the single family detached um, option does provide for the development of those two single family detached residential units. Uh, this option for the two uh, units, if approved, will allow, will allow for compatible infill development in an area that is planned for 10 dwelling units per acre. I believe the subject site can be considered for a maximum of three uh, dwelling units. The existing average density for residential developed lots along this portion of North McDill Avenue between West North A Street and West North B Street excluding the subject site, is approximately 5.84 units per acre. The proposed rezoning would allow consideration of those two single family detached dwelling units on the subject site at an overall density of 6.77 dwelling units per acre. The proposal of two single family detached residential units uh, 
is below the maximum that can be considered for that subject site, which is three. Under the second option, the applicant is requesting a 2,980 square feet model home with office use. The city classifies this type of model home as a commercial use. Under the residential 10 future land use uh, designation, any proposed new commercial use is to comply with the adopted commercial locational criteria. The commercial locational criteria restricts new commercial uses to block faces that contain greater than 50% of the existing commercial zoning. So it's looking at this block right here between North B and North A. Uh, existing non-residential zoning is present within the block. It's on the Southern side of the block right here, um, but it only consists of roughly 25% of the entire block. The proposal is inconsistent with the commercial locational criteria. Uh, the granting of this zoning has the potential to be a tipping point for this block. Uh, the increase would bring the block to a 50% um, non-residential zoning for that block under, thus altering the applicability of the commercial locational criteria for the remaining two residential lots, the one to the south of the subject site and the one to the north. With this change for this zoning, these two parcels to the north and south would now meet commercial locational criteria um, in the future. Though model homes uh, can be temporary uses, um, there is uh, no way to ensure that this parcel would transition into the two uh, residential units shown uh, under the option one. The model home would place a commercial use between two residentially zoned parcels. This potentially could have negative impacts to those remaining residential uses. The proposed commercial use does not provide for the typical setbacks that you would see under a commercial or office use. Overall, though the comprehensive plan is supportive of the residential infill proposed under option one, the introduction of a commercial use that does not meet the adopted commercial locational criteria and is located between two residentially zoned parcels would be inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. So based on uh, that criteria, the Planning Commission does find, the Planning Commission staff, excuse me, finds that the proposed plan development is inconsistent with the provisions of the Imagine 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions. Any questions? All right, thank you very much. Next. Uh, Mary Samaniego, can you please share my screen? Can you see it? Yes, we can, go ahead. Okay, um, Mary Samaniego again, this is REZ 2069, as I stated, just a rezoning request from RS50 to plan development for detached single family residential and a model dwelling unit. Um, the property is located at 210 North McDill Avenue. And um, as David stated, there are two development options. Um, those development options are reflected in the site plan that I'll show in a moment. Um, the first development option is to um, construct a model home with associated parking to the south, and then that would operate for a given amount of time. And then um, when that is no longer serving as a model home, then where the parking lot would is currently existing would be developed to a second detached single family lot. And again, I'll show you in, in more detail in one moment. Um, each of the proposed development options have corresponding um, requirements for setbacks, height, um, setbacks and height for accessory structures proposed, as well as parking requirements. There are two waivers being requested. One is to reduce the required youth buffer, um, again, for option one, which is the model home option um, from 15 foot buffer with a six foot wall along the north and south property lines to six feet with the PVC fence along the north and six feet, I'm sorry, a three foot buffer with the six foot PVC fence along the south, again, to provide some um, landscape buffering for those adjoining residential properties. Mary, right. can you make it bigger as it's a little small on the screen? Can you expand it?
Mary, you need to switch the screen option because we're seeing the PowerPoint control where you advance it. Uh, I'm not sure how to do that. Full screen? Full screen option? When you show your screen, you choose either screen one or screen two. So you need to choose the opposite of the one you're showing right now. I don't see that option. What exactly are you seeing? We see the screen, but we see like your control panel version where you can move forward on the slides and and whatnot. And your, and your, and your next slide yeah. preview. Oh, that's better. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Where was, okay, so um, the second waiver that they're asking for is a reduction in a backup um, drive off from 24 feet to 21 feet. Um, this is option one. Let me zoom in. So this will be a model home. It, it will look like a regular house with a detached garage um, and a covered raised deck and a pool. And then to serve that model home, there will be a um, parking lot to the south. Um, with eight parking spaces, ingress and egress coming off of McDill, and then um, a sole one-way exit onto the alley. Um, the waivers that I spoke about for landscaping and natural resources is um, because this is considered a commercial use, um, it's required 15 feet landscape buffer with the wall for, against the house to the north and to the south. They're asking to reduce that down to six feet to the north and three feet to the south and a PVC fence in lieu of a wall. The second waiver um, from the back of a required parking space to the far edge of a alleyway is required a 24 foot backup distance. They are proposing to reduce that down to 21 feet. Um, this shows uh, proposed plantings and landscaping. They're compliant with all of the um, green space provisions as far as what is required for um, the VUA requirements for the parking lot as well as for the detached single family units. So then option two would be once this um, property is no longer used as a model home and it is sold off as a private residence, the property to the south, which I just showed you, was the parking lot will now be converted to a second lot to be developed with a single family house. These are building elevations of what are proposed. I can let the applicant speak in more detail to that, the specific elevations. Here is the subject property. David already showed the surrounding property. Um, it's all RS-50. The lots are conforming with the RS-50 zoning standards. The reason and the catalyst for the PD is the inclusion of the model home use. Here is property to the north and to the south to detached single family houses. And to the west and to the east are also detached single family houses and the property is currently vacant. Saying that um, overall the development and um, I'm sorry, the development review compliance staff did find this inconsistent with the city of Tampa land development code. Um, see the staff findings related to the um, backup distance for the drawbell reduction waiver from 24 feet to 21 feet. Do you have any questions for me at this time? Do you have any questions at this time from council members? Councilman Miranda. You're muted, sir. I'd like to ask a question regarding the um, model home. What, what? Once you built, and, and this was south of Canada, I would be asking the question, but north of Canada, the, 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 the south, the northern area of Kennedy and MacDill is pretty well single family uh, applicants of homes all the way around. And I'm, I'm looking at this model home. Is that considered a residential model? Is that residential zoning or commercial zoning? It is. I'm not, I'm not clear on what you're asking, sir. In other words, when you built a home and it's not to live in, but to have you know, show place, a model just to show what you got, does that fall under a uh, residential or does it fall in another class? 
I mean, the, the building itself will be a residential structure. Um, again, I'm gonna let uh, the applicant speak to that. I would assume it has to meet residential building code. It's built as a residential structure. For zoning purposes, the use at when it is a model home is in effect a commercial use because the public's coming in and out of the structure and it requires parking and has more of a um, commercial impact. That's what I'm at. Yes. All right, thank you. Okay. Any other questions for me? Anybody else? Hearing none, all right. Thank you very much. Anybody else before we go to the applicant? All right, Mr. Robles. Yes, <clears throat> um, I have submitted uh, uh, some drawings. I believe that you guys have control over. If I could get those up on the screen. Ah, there we go. <clears throat> um, there's about six pages, and I'll kind of use that as a as a. a, a roadway to kind of Ms. Wells, Mr. Robles, if you could identify yourself and just confirm that you've been sworn in i'm sorry my name is kevin robles i have been sworn in <laughs> um this this project located at 210 north mcdill avenue it is a proposed model dwelling unit for uh the showcase of homes residential homes single family homes that are being built in the area as well as a pre-construction sales office Domain homes, and this is a, actually a replacement for the model home center that we currently um, reside at um, 50, 5701 South McDill. So as the, as the market moves, um, we've identified this site as a, a new site for a new uh, model home complex. Domain homes is a woman-owned small business. We focus in on residential infill and uh, redevelopment in lieu of uh, greenfield or urban sprawl development. Um, we do both affordable housing, workforce housing, and market rate homes. This obviously is in our uh, market rate um, space. Um, our philosophy is simple. We build houses and inspire to enrich our homeowners' lives and the community. Current Dis Discovery Center is located at 5701 South McDill Avenue. It opened in 2014. It's kind of important to understand that because it will be closing and selling that model off as a single family residential home. Um, there's a also a small area uh, with an accessory office space that will be demolished and a new single family home built in that space too. It is exactly what we're proposing in this new model home complex. Um, we have freestanding signs. They're not illuminated. Um, typical lifespan of a, of a model home center is about five to seven years. Um, one of the reasons is that you that you build a new model center's architectural taste change, markets change. So I think um, um, Councilman Miranda, you asked the question. That's that's the that's the new newest latest style of single family architecture. When you see that sort of that postmodern that postmodern house that you're seeing in that in that rendering. Um, the new Discovery Center will comply with city code section 27-287.2, which regulates model dwelling units and sales office. The code does speak to model homes. Um, that code is somewhat tied to um, the new Tampa area and attaching a model home center to a planned subdivision, you have to really kind of look at these neighborhoods as they're the exact same, they're subdivisions, they just happen to be older. And as the city evolves, these subdivisions begin to have redevelopment in them. Um, the Discovery Center includes a four bedroom model home with an accessory building garage that Mary spoke of um, before that empties out into the alley. Um, we also run a design center through there where where the customers come and pick all, all their colors and option. You'll have a beautifully landscaped parking area and outdoor living space. Aesthetically, this will be um, uh, very much an added benefit to that, to that McDill corridor there. Sales hours are typical. They're Monday through Saturday, Saturday 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then Sunday 12 to 6. 
typically have one or two salespeople in the model center at any one time. Um, we propose opening it in 2021 with the city council's approval. Once a new discovery center is open, the current, current discovery center will be converted to a single, back to the single family home and be sold off to a new home in the parking area. Just like you see in this proposal, and the parking area will be converted to a single family home, a single family home permitted, built, and sold. Um, I want to kind of go to the location context. <clears throat> the new Discovery Center site is on the McDill Avenue, two blocks north of Kennedy. McDill Avenue is a busy four lane collector road in this location. A professional office and large residential building with a small parking lot are located just to the south. You'll see the uh, photo of those two buildings. And then a single family ho uh, ho home is located just to the north. There's a small business directly across the street that's signed as Psychic Reading, which uh, is located directly across from this site. Um, under the Tampa Comprehensive Plan, the locational criteria is proposed development represents appropriate infill for the, the oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, can you guys switch to the next slide? Slide number five. There we go. Um, the proposed development represents appropriate infill for the future land use locational criteria. Model dwelling with a sales office is commonly used in large residential developments, typically located in small residential streets. Non-residential use is located to the south and to the east of this subject site. Model homes have a natural lifespan of about seven years due to updating the architectural styles, improved construction methodologies and technologies, and market demands and customer preferences. So actually the, the model center naturally ages itself out. And in this particular case, this model center will simply be reverted back to a single family residential home. Model homes produce low levels of traffic. Typically we have anywhere from 20 to 30 visitors a week in a seven day period. Uh, model homes typically um, are done by appointment um, as far as the showing of the model homes and model homes are single family residential buildings. Um, the waiver, well, we're looking for a reduction of the landscaped area and will be mitigated with an in lieu fee payment to the district for a use of um, six foot vinyl PVC fence in lieu of a masonry wall PV sense the PVC fence is more in keeping with a single family development than a, than a masonry wall. Um, it provides the same uh, uh, opaque finish as a wall does, and it's low maintenance on both sides of the fence, have a finished side for both adjoining property owners on either side of the fence. Um, additionally, we've eliminated windows on the second floor on the north side of, of the accessory building so as to not intrude to home to the north. Reduction of a setback from 24 to 21 feet uh, is in the alley, not on McDill Avenue. Um, only one car garage is in use while the model home center is in operation. Once converted to a residence, the three car uh, garage will access the alley. Um, we'll make all the corrections between the first reading and the second reading. And we are requesting that you respectfully request that you uh, uh, approve us for this exciting, innovative, and compatible use. Councilman Dingfelder. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rebels, um, my only concern is in regard to parking. And I do agree with you. Um, that on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of your customers um you know that you had you might have one you know one here one there that sort of thing um but the there are times at down at your south mcdill current location where you would be nice enough to invite um many realtors to come down for a presentation or something like that and 
as a matter of disclosure, I've attended probably one or two several years ago. And then you have a lot of people and a lot of parking issues. I'm, I know, I know you, you know what I'm talking about because you've been there. Sure. So, um, I know you have another facility over, over by Ybor city. That's kind of similar, um, for a different product, but I'm just wondering, you know, what is, what is your contingency plan for those type of events or, or are you not going to be holding those type of events at this facility? Well, typically, um, it, it actually, John, is a good question. When you have a single family residential home, which you're using to host events in, the capacity is really limited by the type of structure that it is. Um, and if we have an overflow event, typically what we will do is we will, we have gone as far as to find a proper location and valet those realtors in and kind of turn that parking issue into something a little more special where we, we ask them to park in a, an alternative location and we'll bus them in and, you know, you know, in a kind of a, a bus type limousine. So, um, I, I don't see that much pro as a, a, a huge problem. We have nine spaces on site. Um, and we only have four spaces on the existing site under the model home, uh, in the, as you read through the code, the requirement is only 10. Now I realize we're converting this over into a commercial component, but we've asked for no parking waivers. And I don't see John, that may be, um, Councilman Dinkfelder, it may very well be a couple times a year. Usually it's for 45 minutes or less. And it's usually some presentational piece that we've got going on. Yeah, I mean, you know, realistically, uh, I guess you're not too far from the from the side street. Um, I'm not sure which side street that is, North B or <clears throat> or what have you. It's closer to North B than it is North A. Yeah, and and you know, realistically, I guess people would, you know, your guests, and I'm talking about not the day to day two or three or five people. I'm talking about you know, when you have 30 or 40 folks there, um, which, you know, I, I think did happen down there at McDill. Uh, it wasn't a problem down there because you didn't have residential nearby, but, um, I guess if you all just, uh, we, we could, we could work there. try to partner with the, um, that the office just to the South, they have plenty of parking and, um, you know, kind of a good neighbor kind of policy, maybe make an arrangement for those folks. We, uh, we certainly do that or, or you can do it up there with permission. You could do it up there with the Mexican restaurant. Uh, but typically I think it's lunchtime. When you have to okay. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Mr. Chair, if I may. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Robles, uh, because of your hours of operation, I'm, I'm not too concerned about the fence heights. That, that will take care of itself more than likely. Uh, business will not be taking place after six o'clock. So there really shouldn't be any disturbance to your neighbors. Um, but my concern is what guarantees are we going to have that toward the end of this lifespan, it is not turned into a medical uh, facility or some other type of small business. And what kind of guarantees do we have as council that that parking lot will be turned into a home? your option B. Looks like Mary has her hand up. Ms. Amini, go ahead. Mr. Robles, I'm not, if, Mr. Robles, if you want to answer that, he asked you directly, but I can answer that if you'd like. Um, no, go ahead, Mary. I, I think I know how you want to answer it, so go ahead. Um, because this is a PD, because this is a plan development, the plan development always lists the only uses that are allowed. So this plan development, the only uses that are allowed, if this gets approved, is a model home and a detached single family house, period. If they want to amend uses to the plan development, it has to come back before city council. As Thank you, Ms. San Diego. I, 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 I completely understand that. And I know that the use will have to be changed by coming back to us. What I'm yeah. trying to get is just Mr. Robles to answer my question. Uh, well, uh, um, Councilman Citro, I will, I will answer that. The economics of building a single family residential home, uh, its highest and best use is that there is no economic 
benefit to doing anything other than than selling it in the marketplace as a single family resident to as a single family residential home. Okay, I'm still looking for some sort of guarantees, and I understand that that would have to be changed if it was sold. But, but thank you, Mr. Robles, I do appreciate it. Um, I, 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 we're also happy to articulate that condition in more detail in the PD if that is council's pleasure. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Just a second bite at the apple, if I may. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Chairman. In fact, there's a home, I don't know if it's yours or some other uh, developer, and, and I have uh, everything but praise for domain and yourself, Mr. Robles. There's a house being built on Cherry and uh, Magdill. It's, uh, the design is similar to this, not quite as large, but it's about uh, across the street on the west side of St. Joseph uh, School. And it's a real nice looking home. The design is almost like this. It's, it's built something different that I haven't seen in West Tampa. That's the first one that I've seen. I'm not saying there's others that haven't been built. But, uh, but my only concern is what I said. It, it is a single family lot, RS50, with a home. That is, until somebody walks in it, it becomes something other than a residential dwelling. But what I'm saying, uh, and I think the code still hasn't changed, if an individual buyer was to buy the house and he wanted to have, a, or he or she wanted to have a home occupational use, they could show the house as a home occupational use, you know, one or two persons a week or something, because you can do that now as a barber, you can do that as a realtor, uh, unless the code has changed. But what I'm saying is I have no problem with the house being built if it wasn't an RS50 lot. Because once it's built, it's an RS50 dwelling, residential dwelling. But once you show it, it's no longer a residential dwelling. It becomes a commercial dwelling. That's just my opinion. I'm not a lawyer. Um, uh, Chairman Rand, I'm not a I, 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 Councilman Rand. I'm not an attorney either. I think you're. I think you're. Um, maybe Mary can answer that one. I think the home occupation, it, uh, the, the occupancy of the home are, are restricted by the, the floor area by the code, is it not? That's right. If I'm, answering it, if I'm understanding the question, right. the question. That doesn't mean they can't walk around the house. In other words, you had a room with a desk, that's the realtor's opportunity or the broker, whatever. That doesn't mean that the person who walks in can't walk around the house or can't use a bathroom. That's just my opinion. Again, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I don't plan to be one. I only play one on TV. <laughs> they always win too. <laughs> uh, I'm Mr. Saying, uh, I'm Mr. Saying, Chair, Mr. Chair. Yes. Yeah. Can, can you, can you, Y'all, okay, good. I apologize. I just want to say for the record, um, I've been watching this on television and listening uh, while uh, staff was working on my numerous technological issues. I wanted to thank staff uh, yet again for bailing me out. I'm back for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilman Dingfelder. Councilman Dingfelder, you're muted. Said, I said, I am a lawyer and I'm looking up at the top left corner as Mary mentioned on the site plan and it says proposed use, model dwelling unit, paren, single family detached and pre-construction sales office slash design studio to future single family detached residences. So I'm not overly concerned based upon the limitation that's expressly stated on the, on the site plan I'm not overly concerned about any other type of uses because if there was a different type of use proposed medical or what have you, that uh, they'd have to come in for a revised PD site plan, right, Mary? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. anybody else? Mr. Chair, if I may, Mary, if, if, the, if the building doesn't change, the building stays exactly the same way and just a business wants to go in there, would that would be available? No, sir. You'd still have to you'd still have to come in for us and change the PD. Correct. Thank you. 
Thank the you. Building has to, all the buildings have to remain the same and all the uses have to remain the same in any combination thereof. All right, public comment. Madam Clerk, do we have anybody registered and on the line for public comment from item number six? Yes, sir. We have one person that's on the line who is um, Andrew Aubrey. Okay. And the other person did not log on, who is Catherine okay. Ecovera. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. All right, Andrew, if you could raise your right hand, they're going to swear you in. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. All right, go ahead, sir. You have three minutes to speak. <clears throat> I'm here to represent Oakford Park uh, Neighborhood Association. We have several concerns with this uh, plan development. Uh, number one is that it's being found inconsistent by the city staff. Um, number two, the square footage of both of these lots is approximately 13,256. When you divide that by two, that's 6,628. The proposed building is 4,637. 4, that's nearly 70% of the lot is gonna be built, and that's not including the pool, that's not including the lanai, or any other thing, that we're just talking about the structures that are gonna be built that's very large and in our neighborhood, the size, the average size of the home is the size of the garage that they're gonna be, be, be being built, which is 1600 square foot. It's a very, very large property. Um, we're all very concerned about the parking overflow. As you mentioned, one of the councilmen mentioned before, there's often parties that are held at these events. Where are these cars gonna park? They're gonna overflow into our neighborhood they can't park on McDill Avenue, so they're gonna overflow and overwhelm our already exacerbated um, neighborhood that gets all the cut through traffic already. So where are these gonna be? It's gonna be a safety concern as these cars start to pile up on the road is that where the emergency service is gonna be able and how are they gonna be able to pass? I believe that this is gonna open the future, the door to multifamily, I mean, again, who needs a 4,600 square foot home uh, in West Tampa? These homes are better, uh, you know, in, in New Tampa or in Beach Park. Our RS50 lots just cannot support these uh, egregious sizes. Again, we do not agree with the waivers of making the parking lot smaller. I mean, how are these people gonna be pulling out of the parking lot? I mean, where are the, where's the staff going to stay? Um, you know, I mean, I see five parking spots. I'm assuming most people for safety concerns are going to have two people at the, at the facility at all times. So that's going to leave three parking spots available. Um, again, the average size of a garage is 576 square feet and they're proposing 1600 square feet for a three car garage. Again, we're very concerned about this. We're very concerned on how it's it's residential, but it's commercial and it's waivers here, but not meeting standards here. It's like they want their cake and eat it too. We're very, we love domain homes. We're, we've been on record many times telling you guys that if they take an RS50 lot and they, they knock it, the old home down and they build a new one, we're fine with that. But we're not fine with multifamily. Our, uh, we've come many times to you guys, we've told you 85% of our community is single family homes detached and most of them do not have a 1600 square foot mother-in-law suite or garage so again we're very concerned and we hope that you go back to the drawing table and and change some of these things and if we can get some more um uh, guarantees we'd be in favor of this project thank you very much thank you very much all right do we have anybody else registered that's it chair and anybody at the convention center that wishes to speak on this item? This is Eileen Rosario from Planning and Development, and there's no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there any rebuttal from the applicant, Mr. Robles? Uh, yes, uh, and to answer Oakford Park's um, concerns, um, a couple of them. The, uh, the house itself is 2,963 square feet. Um, 
that's the, the footprint of the house. It's not 70% of the land area used as a building. There are um, eight, nine spaces on site, not five um, in the drawing. So there is no waivers being requested for parking. And on the one waiver for reducing the, the, the alley uh, back out off of the garage from 24 to 21, we can slide the whole project forward from its current setback, slide it forward by three feet, and we still would be con consistent with the existing structures on the block face of McDill. So I think we can solve a couple of those issues that the gentleman brought up from the Oakford Park Neighborhood Association by, number one, I'm, I'm clarifying some of, his, some of his concerns. And then number two is we can slide the, the, entire, the entire complex forward by three feet and not and not go for uh, the waiver on the on the back for the for the back for the back out parking. Okay. Any questions, comments from council members? Council Member Dingfelder. You're muted. I think you're muted. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Rebels, the, um, I, I was, you know, I guess they have the same concerns I, that I articulated. Um, I guess my question is, how, why does that back building, which you described eventually will be a three-car garage, but three-car garage is pretty unusual for, you know, for, I mean, you guys don't typically do three car garages that I'm familiar with. Usually you have two car garages, but why do, why do you need to have such a large building on the backside that's making that neighborhood so nervous? Is that something that you could consider modifying? Well, and, our, our, let, 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 me, let me finish. And, and, then, and then my other uh, question, and I think you can solve this perhaps with an additional condition um, on your site plan is maybe to limit the these events um, to x you know x number of people invited and only have them once a month or something like that. So then that way, you know, I mean, listen, if it was a residential house and and I lived there and I decided I I wanted to have a party with thirty friends once a month, they they overflowed in the neighborhood nothing the neighborhood could do about it. But in this case, there, you know, you're asking for an exception and a sort of semi-commercial use for five to seven years. So I think we need to listen to the neighborhood and accommodate the neighborhood um, and address their concerns. So you, we can't make you put a condition like that on there, but we can ask you if you'd consider, you know, a condition of limiting, you know, 30 invited guests at any one time and maybe once a month or whatever else you think is reasonable. Um, yeah, uh, yes, um, Councilman Dingfelder, I'll, I'll go ahead and address that. Um, I, I am more than willing to limit the number of events per year. I can limit the number of events to, to six per year every other month. Um, we don't hold as many as you think we do. Um, and I'm more than willing to, to limit it to 30 guests, I, I'm thrilled when I can get 20 people to show up. And it typically involves me throwing a lot of fancy food at them just to get them to show up for these for these events. The events are in the day, the, the events are typically in the daytime hours and they're typically, I'm lucky to, to, to hold them for 90 minutes. And then lastly, I mean, you want a condition that uh, overflow parking is handled through offsite through a legal ballet operation. We typically do that anyway, because if I've got a parking problem, they don't show up. You know, I've got to make it, I've got to make it convenient for them to come to the event. And I have, sort of have to entice the folks to come to the event. So I, I would be amenable to uh, any of that type of, that type of control. Mary Samaniego, then Kate Wells. I don't know 
Thank you, Mary San Diego. I don't know. I was going to ask defer to kid on this. Typically, if city council or the applicant puts a condition on a site plan for a P, that condition is has to be enforced by our code enforcement department. So I find to, I, I, I'm fi having trouble understanding how how would we enforce that? Um, they can make a commitment, but there's a legal difference. Kate, can you speak further to that, please? Thank you, Mary. Um, I just want to remind City Council that pursuant to Section 70.45 of the Florida statutes, any conditions that are placed on the site plan, um, there must be an essential nexus uh, between the impact um, of the proposed rezoning and the public purpose that you're trying to achieve. And this applies even to self-imposed conditions. I think you heard from Mary about the concerns with regard to enforcement of that proposed condition. So it, it's just a reminder that any time, whether it's a city council imposed condition or a self-imposed condition, there has to be a nexus between the condition that is being added to the site plan as it is intended to mitigate the impact of the proposed rezoning. Mr. Chairman, just, yes. just, in, just in response, I, I agree with Ms. Wells completely um parking i pointed out a potential parking problem and it was confirmed by the oakford uh, uh leader um and i think mr robles even acknowledged that parking on rare occasions or uh can be an issue at, at these types of, of of facilities so i think there's i think parking is a very important consideration i think that's a direct nexus to the to the uh, condition that I that I was suggesting, but the other the other thing, uh, Mr. Robles, I don't know if you addressed my or addressed the neighborhood concern about the size of that rear structure and if if there was any way you could modify it, and make it smaller. Uh, not in the immediate concern, but in the future concern. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm sorry, Councilman Dean Felder, <clears throat> that the, the size is predicated on when we set up the model home, we have ancillary activities that we do, such as a design studio and that sort of thing. It takes a minimum of about 400 square feet just to um, show our wares off, if you will. And then additionally, um, the the outdoor lifestyle is really done as a sales tool aspirationally to show the public what their potential or prospective home could be so all those elements are actually um, essential tools in the sales side of the of the of the business if you will okay. That's not, right. not people occupying it. It's it's sinks and granites and kitchen vignettes and cabinetry vignettes. Councilman Goose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership this evening. Uh, I, I see a few concerns: parking, the size. And my biggest thing is, did Mr. Rose, did your organization uh, talk with the neighborhood in reference to this? residential slash possible commercial type setting in, in, their, in their backyard. The first the first we've heard from Oakford Park is tonight. And we we keep clearly open communal lines of communication. Um, in addition to our regular noticing, we do send out a, a letter just kind of you know, paraphrasing what we have and we offer them both cellular contact and email contact um, based upon the virus and that sort of thing. We don't currently conduct neighborhood meetings. We haven't done that for approximately nine months in our long as virus has been running along. Well, I've, I've heard a, a lot of different concerns for a lot of different council members. And again, we can't uh, make anybody do anything, uh, but uh, I, I would kind of suggest maybe we have a little communication maybe with that community. Uh, and I'm, not, I'm not saying how, you, how, how we might proceed tonight or how you want to proceed tonight, but. You just give me a, a thought out for you, sir. Uh, now, for, uh, can I can I back up slightly? I know that was a question, and and Mary, you raised it. Can we make a commitment 
versus a condition. I think I think uh, uh, Ms. Wells weighed in on that. Um, I'm certainly willing to make the commitment if that gives if that gives you um, a little bit better comfort level. Um, the other thing is we're we're over on our parking by by our our, our, our parking calculations um, get us to eight. We're at nine currently, so we're over parked in our in our parking spaces to begin with. Mr. Chairman, Martin Shelby. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, just, just a reminder, uh, council members. Um, the source of your evidence comes from your experts, your planning commission staff report, your city staff report, any experts who might testify, and any neighbors who testify with regard to personal experience, not necessarily their opinion, but facts based on their personal knowledge. Um, just to remind you that that's the sort of evidence in the record that is necessary upon which you must base your decision. I should also point out, Council, and this is something that is not appropriate to discuss during this hearing, uh, perhaps down the road, perhaps it's your October 22nd uh, workshop, but there are other jurisdictions that have in their code the requirement of a neighborhood compatibility meeting. Uh, the city of Tampa does not. So there is no requirement in the code for meeting with neighborhood associations or meeting with neighbors necessar necessarily. The notices are sent out and the notices state that if there are any questions or concerns of the people who do get the notice, they are to contact the applicant. So uh, I just want you to know that. With regard to commitments, um, respectfully, and, and I respect uh, Mr. Robles' uh, willingness to do that, that is of really no legal effect whatsoever. Um, and uh, it would be, um, it would be um, unfortunate for council to rely on that if somewhere down the road somebody makes a, uh, uh, an assertion as to it needing to be enforced because by that point in time, um, there is nothing you can do. So with regard to that, I ask that you again base your decision on competent substantial evidence, either in the staff reports, in the record, or by testimony that you elicit through somebody coming forth or you asking questions. Again, in the form of a question, you can elicit uh, um, evidence. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Councilman Dingfelder. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rebels, in light of all this, um, I, I know you want to move forward with this uh, with great haste and you've probably been delayed because of COVID and, and et cetera, et cetera. But I, I would strongly suggest um, pursuant to what uh, Councilman Goods suggested, um, I'd strongly suggest you, you ask us for a continuance at this point to, to, to meet with that gentleman and his neighborhood association, obviously virtually, we want you to be safe. But to meet with them and to chat about some of these issues, you're right now you're facing an, an inconsistent finding by staff and an inconsistent finding by planning commission staff. You've got questions, uh, big concerns from the neighborhood and questions from council. But to me, it all lines up to say, why don't you why don't you take a month and look at all these issues and see if you can revise your site plan and come back. Um, yeah, well, uh, uh, Councilman Dingfelder, I think I think we'll request a, a continuance. All right, I personally appreciate that. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, therefore, before we close the public hearing, would there then be a motion or Mr. Robles uh, for a continuance that you would be requesting until when? How long would you need? Next month. Let's take a November look at 12th, November 12th, Mr. Chairman, the evening session. Is that very full, Mr. Shelby? As of now, it does not look like that. And a reminder, you will be back at the um, convention okay. center. Ms. San Diego. Um, for the November 12th, you have 13 items, which is typically your limit. Okay. Uh, Let's go to December, where we have December 10th. How bad is December 10th? Looks like Mr. Rables is asking for um, 
for for November. I I would accommodate that, and I'll move to put them on November twelfth. All right, we have a motion. I'll second, Vera. Yes, sir, Shelby. Just the time, please. Six p.m. Yes, sir. If we could make that part of the motion. Make that yes, yeah. Six p.m. Yes, yes, sir. Please. Jim. Yes, Councilman Goods. I I don't I don't mind accommodating this situation here, but we don't want to go back and set a precedent. We said we would only have a certain number of items on dockets. Right. And we don't want to be out one two one two o'clock in the morning as usual. So I I'd go along this time, but I, I I caution us in the future if we've already stick to a plan that we already approved. We need to kind of make sure we, we adhere to that. It's one of my suggestions. Sir. I agree. However, uh, there's a motion on the floor from Councilman Dinkfelder for November 12th at 6 p.m. Second from Councilman Vieira. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Citro. Yes. Goods. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Dinkfelder. Yes. Miranda. Yes. Vieira. Yes. Emaniscaco. Yes. Motion carry unanimously. All right, it's uh, just a little after 7.30. Would anybody like to take a five minute break? Is that, is that fine? All, All right, right, five minute break. Well, uh, do not turn, do not log out of the meeting. You just mute yourself and turn your cameras off, but do not log out and we'll see you in five minutes. Thank you.
domain homes. Roll call. Did we do oh, roll call? Roll call be, before we begin. Go ahead. Vieira. Foods. Here. Carlson. Here. Ding Felder. Here. Cedro. Here. Miranda. Here. Imaniscaco. Here. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Swear the witnesses. Um. Uh, we yes. Let's do. I mean, even though Mr. Robles was here for the last one, but let's let's swear everybody in. Go ahead. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear for him? You would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Thank you. All and right. the clerk's office did not receive any written comments on this item. Thank you very much. All right. Let's begin. Mary San Diego Planning Design and Development Coordination. Item number seven is REZ 2070. It's a rezoning request from RM24 to RO1 for the property located at 1905 North Mitchell Avenue. I defer to David Hay at the Planning Commission, please. Good evening, Council Members. David Hay with your Planning Commission staff. I have been sworn. We remain in the Central Tampa Planning District uh, for this next case, more specifically, um, the Central Park Urban Village. Uh, the subject site, um, there is transit within uh, proximity of the site, approximately 190 feet to the north at the corner of North Mitchell and East Palm Avenue. That uh, Palm Avenue is served by Route 5. The subject site is also not located within an evacuation zone. On to the aerial. Uh, this site is generally just north of uh, downtown. Downtown's out of frame to, on the bottom. This is uh, Nebraska Avenue, and then Mitchell is one block um, west of, of um, Nebraska Avenue, kind of southwest of the Palm and Nebraska intersection. Of course, this is Interstate 275, and this building down here uh, to the south is the GTE uh, Credit Union office building. Here we have the, uh, the future land use map. Uh, the subject site and all these properties in this, um, I guess, light purple color, um, is that urban mixed use 60. Uh, the purple down here on the bottom is uh, the regional mixed use 100. You're heading into the Encore development, the further south you go. You've got some residential 83, this dark brown uh, to the west, and it goes down to, I believe that's a res 20. And then you've got CMU 35 on the east side of Nebraska Avenue. Uh, the subject site is within that urban mixed use 60 future land use designation, which allows uh, for the consideration of high intensity and density, horizontal and mixed use and single use development including general and intensive uh, commercial service, office and residential uses. The proposed residential office one zoning district is consistent with the development pattern anticipated under that urban mixed use. Uh, the request to rezone the subject site from the multifamily uh, RM24 zoning district to RO would allow for comparable and compatible infill development within that Central Park urban village. There should be no negative impacts to the surrounding residential uses um, based on the development that could be considered under that zoning district. And based on that, the Planning Commission staff does find that the proposed rezoning is consistent with the provisions of the Imagine 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Mary San Diego, can you please share my screen? Can you see my presentation? Right. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. This is REZ 9, uh, 2070. Again, it's a rezoning request to residential office one. Um, the property is located in 1905 North Mitchell Avenue and it's currently vacant. It's 0 0.31 acres and it's one lot to the southeast of the South Palm Avenue North Mitchell Avenue intersection. Um, the property is surrounded by detached single family residences and model homes to the north and the R01 zoning district multifamily structure to the west across North Mitchell Avenue and a vacant lot to the south, all within the existing RM24 zoning district. 
There is an aerial photograph of the um, surrounding area. There are no local or national historic structures. Um, again, property to the north is already zoned R01. This applicant is requesting to go to R01 to the direct um, east of the property is Nebraska on both sides is the YC5 zoning district for Ebor City, which is comparable to a commercial general zoning district. Here is the property to the east of the subject property is currently vacant along Nebraska. To the west is a single family house. To the north is a model home and to the south is another vacant lot. Um, overall, the development review and compliance staff found this consistent with the City of Tampa Land Development Code. I'm available for any questions. Do you have any questions for Mary at this time? Okay, hearing none. Uh, Mr. Robles? Um, uh, Council, um, I, I really have nothing more to add. This is the Euclidean Rezone. Um, this property is owned by Domain Homes. The joining property is owned by Domain Homes it actually is our model home uh, uh for it that is our urban 360 model home um that lot was uh, purchased some time ago by us and it is anticipated that we will put a second model home on that property at some point in time uh, the zoning was incompatible for the model home center the r01 uh, uh, is more is the appropriate zoning should we just put a second model home on that spot? Do we have any okay. questions for the applicant? I'm gonna add. Oh, go ahead, sir. I, other than that, I have nothing more to add. Oh, okay. Any questions for the applicant at this time? If not, we'll go to public comment. All right. Is there anyone registered to speak for public comment uh, or at the convention center for item number seven, REZ 2070? No one has registered to speak on this item. This is Eileen Rosario from Planning and Development, and there's no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. Very good. Uh, any questions or comments from Council? Anything, Mr. Robles, anything else you'd like to add? No, that's it. Thank you. May I have a motion to close? Oh, no. Motion to close from Councilman Citro with a second from Councilman Miranda. Any objection? Hearing no objection by unanimous consent, this uh, hearing is closed. Mr. Carlson, would you mind reading item number seven? Yes, sir. Hang on a second. Item number, I move item number seven, file number REZ 20 70, ordinance being presented for first reading consideration, ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 1905 North Mitchell Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification RM24 residential multifamily to RO1 residential office providing an effective date. Second. We have a, was that a second from Councilman Miranda? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, second from Councilman Miranda, let's have a roll call vote, please. Boots. Yes, I did hear what was happening. I was last time, but I did hear the whole meeting. Thank you. Miranda? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Inkfelder? Yes. Hannes Gasco? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on November 5th at 9.30 a.m. Thank you very much. Mr. Robles, you still have what one more? Yes, you do. Uh, coming up. All right, item number eight. Thank Mary you. Sam Thank you, Mary Samaniego. Item number eight is REZ 2073. It's a rezoning request from plan development to plan development for a private recreational facility. The site is located at 1080 South Clearview Avenue. I'm sorry, we need to be sworn. Yes. Um, who is the applicant for number eight? If you are the applicant, please uh, turn on your camera, mute yourself, and we'll swear you in. Uh, Sam Corson for Friends of. You have to turn your camera on. Hmm. 
Okay, we have uh, Sam Corson and is it Larry Sludge? Uh, Mr. Sludge, if you could unmute yourself. And then we have a William Martin. William Martin, we cannot see your face yet. You have to turn your camera on. Okay, we have, uh, we still can't see William Martin. There, uh, okay, there we go. All right, please raise your right hands to uh, be sworn in. Oh, we have another gentleman. Sir, uh, raise your right hand to be sworn in. All right. Do you swear for me you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. All right, Mary. And the clerk's office did receive rain comments on this item. Thank you. Um, I defer to David Hay, please, for his presentation. Go ahead. Mr. Shelby, I've got a, a point of order, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Sure. Um, when I see the, the cast of characters on my on the screen here, it gives me some concern. Um, I'm not familiar with this project at all, but I would have known Mr. Corson for two, 30 something years. His wife used to babysit for my kids. <laughs> Mr. Jones actually sold my wife our house, and I've known him professionally uh, for many years. And I don't know these other two guys, but anyway, uh, Mr. Shelby, um, no, you, are you seriously? Well, I seriously, I just want to be sure. You saying you don't know these other two guys? Are, I just I want to make know, sure you're not. I don't know Mr. Sledge or Mr. Martin. Okay, um, well let me let me ask you this then. If I, I have some concern. You, Okay, well, let me let's inquire. Let's find out because under under Chapter Two Eighty Six of Florida Statutes, uh, <clears throat> except for ser several narrow circumstances, you have an obligation to vote. So let's just make sure that um, first of all, you stated at the outset that you are not familiar specifically um, with this application in the sense that you have absolutely no financial stake one way or the other in the outcome of this matter. Is that correct? Right. Okay. So in that sense, then um, any relative of yours or anybody by whom you are uh, retained have an, a financial stake in the outcome of this matter? No, my, here's my concern is um, Mr. Goods uh, recused himself the other day from uh, an item up, I think it was up there near Hillsborough Avenue. And he said that he, he and his family had been very close friends with uh, the the petitioner, and he didn't feel comfortable participating, and and I'm not picking on you, Orlando. I'm just kind of saying I'm I'm sort of feeling the same way. On okay. This well, one. let me ask, let me let me ask you this then, and that's a very good point that you brought up, and uh, and certainly uh, Councilman Goods and I have have discussed this sort of thing. Um, obviously, as local elected officials, and this comment goes to everybody on City Council. As local elected officials, uh, you campaign, um, you get elected, and you know this city, and a lot of people in the city know you more so than most people. So yes, you will have relationships with people. The question comes to a provision that was added relatively recently within the past, I don't know, 2013, Florida statutes, to ensure a, um, a fair proceeding um, free from potential bias, you can abstain. But here's the ultimate question. The ultimate question is, as a finder of fact, and as a somebody who is sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity, can you be fair and impartial and judge your decision and base your decision on the evidence, the competent substantial evidence that you find in the record? If the answer to that is yes, then Florida statute says that you must vote. Florida statutes also says that if you uh, find yourself unable to do that, or for whatever reason, um, it goes beyond um, a mere friendship, or it goes beyond, uh, uh, for instance, uh, to use an example, a longstanding business relationship that your family may have with somebody else's family, that could be a basis for recusal. So, okay. based on right, let me cut you off. Let me cut you off, Mr. Shelby. I I, I because, because this question is coming up more often. 
because what I don't want to have happen is I don't want to say I don't want council members to be accused of saying this is too difficult a decision or I have too close a relationship therefore I am unable to serve because I cannot vote that's the my only concern and I'm just saying that to you councilman Dinkfelder it's just a general concern to city council um no I, I hear you um I do believe I can be fair and impartial um, when Mr. Corson popped up on the screen, haven't seen him for a while, but you know, I, I do have very good feelings, you know, toward him and his family. Mr. Jones, I can take or leave. No, I'm just kidding, Hamilton. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, but anyway, now with, in all seriousness, uh, I can I can be fair and impartial. I realize that we do see a lot of people that we know, or people that we're friendly with in the rezoning process and I'll, I'll work through it. Thank you. Marty, Thank could you. I, could I just ask you one too? I, that can councilman Carlson. Yes, please. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, it, it looks like this is scouting related. My son, uh, one of my sons was a member of a, of a boy scout troop. I, it looks like it's the, maybe the same one. He's no longer a member of it. He was a member of it last year, but he's not now. Um, so I don't think that's a conflict. If you think it is, let me well, obviously, uh, it doesn't seem like you're indicating that there's any financial stake by you or any member of your family or somebody who, uh, your firm uh, yeah. or anybody else by whom you retain. Okay. Yeah. Well, then my question to you is, can you be fair and impartial and base your decision on the evidence in the record? Yes. Well, that's my professional opinion that under Florida statutes, you do have an obligation to vote. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Councilman Goods. This is Director Mr. Shelby, and I always, yes, uh, I always like when he uh, interjects and, and makes it to where we understand our place. Uh, I remember I, I did get a phone call uh, last week, Mr. Dingfelder and Mr. Shelby explained to me in detail uh, those situations that I had, and one of those was correct. Uh, well, both were kind of correct, but he kind of led me down the right path of the keyword is financial. Uh, obligation or gain with a family member and so forth so forth. So I think maybe Mr. Shelby might have a sidebar with everybody maybe in the future to kind of curtail what abstaining really does mean when we have these kind of conflicts so we don't have to hold up the meeting so we actually know. Again, I thank you for your help last week, Mr. Shelby. Okay, and, and let me thank you. Thank you, Councilman Goose. And Mr. Chairman, I don't want to belabor this, but here's an here's an important point. If you cannot be fair and impartial and if there is reason to believe if there is reason to believe you are biased or prejudiced then that could damage the city's position relative to you going forward so i'm talking in generalities but certainly one who is biased or prejudiced therefore in order to ensure a fair proceeding may have to abstain but i have not heard any facts to that effect in some uh since we've had this discussion councilman Vieira. No, I was just going to say, I think this is a good discussion to have, obviously not for tonight, uh, but just in general. I mean, I, I've taken a lot of votes uh, where um, applicants are, are uh, people who are close to me one way or the other. Um, I've voted for them. I voted, I've voted. i had some very awkward situations. I remember one vote. I can say this now, but it was uh, somebody you may not that I'm want good to friend. Go into specifics. <laughs> I'm just oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This was years ago, uh, somebody that I was friends with, and uh, after the vote, I immediately got an angry email from his wife, from his sister, uh, and, and it was really awkward, but you got to do what you got to do. Um, but yeah, it, it's a good discussion to have. I'll say nothing else. Anybody Thank else? You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Well, I don't have any friends, so I'm good. Anyways. <laughs> you got six right here. I'll <laughs> second the motion. All right. All right, let's continue. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Council Members. David Hay again with your Planning Commission staff. I have been sworn. Um, the next item we is 2073. It's in located within the South Tampa uh, Planning District, more specifically within the uh, Gulf Gulf View uh, neighborhood. Uh, there is transit uh, located approximately 0.2 miles to the south, at the corner of uh, West San Carlos and Del Mabry. That uh, Del Mabry, that portion of Del Mabry is served by Heart Route 19. And the subject site is located within a level uh, C evacuation zone. Uh, here we have uh, the subject site. You, uh, you could see it's on this uh, 
very unique corner here. Uh, this is Dale Maybury. These are all the commercial uses uh, that line this portion of Dale Maybury. Right off Dale Maybury, it goes into single family detached. And of course you have Plant High School uh, directly uh, to the south. Here we have the future land use map, uh, the subject site and the, the property located to the northeast and the east in the yellow is that residential six future land use category. Uh, immediately to the west, in the pink, that's the community mixed use 35 future land use category. The school is represented by blue. That's the public, uh, semi-public future land use category. And then there is a uh, strip of residential 20 on the east side of Clearview uh, going up. That would be where any um, townhomes or multifamilies uh, could be considered. Uh, the applicant is requesting approval through this rezoning petition to rezone a 0.31 acre uh, subject site from a PD to another PD to allow for a uh, 1,975 square foot private recreation, private recreational facility, excuse me. The surrounding development pattern offers a unique buffering from the residential uses. Southdale Maybury Highway is located approximately 175 feet to the west. And as a result, the subject site interfaces the backside of commercial uses uh, to its uh, west. Uh, to the immediate south, again, is Plant High, and to the east is the single-family detached residence. The proposed PD orients the private recreational facility to the western portion of the subject site, providing ample space between the facility and residents to the east. Further, the PD elevations propose a form that will be compatible with the scale and character of the surrounding uh, neighborhood. Overall, the proposed private recreational facility is comparable and compatible with the surrounding neighborhood and with the development pattern anticipated under that residential six future land use category. Uh, therefore, your planning commission staff does find and recommend to you this evening that the proposed uh, plan development be found consistent with the provisions of the Imagine 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next. Thank you, Mary Samaniego. Can you share my screen, please? Thank you. Um, again, this is case uh, 2073. It's for a plan development for a private recreational facility. Um, overall, the development review and compliance staff did find this inconsistent based on the local street access waiver. Um, this property is currently vacant. It's at 1080 South uh, Clearview Avenue. It was an existing PD from 1985 for a congregate living facility. That use has um, since been vacated and the entire property is scraped and vacant. Um, the applicant is proposing a private recreational facility to be built on the property. Um, there are three waivers being requested. Um, a private recreational facility in this land use category requires special use criteria reviews found in section 27, 132, and those are detailed and analyzed in your staff reports before you council. Um, the waiver, the first waiver related to this criteria of 132 is um, private recreational facilities are supposed to only access arterial and collectors. Um, unfortunately, in this scenario, um, this property only has access to local streets, which are South Clearview Avenue and West San Miguel. So by default, they are requesting this waiver to access those local streets. The other waiver related to the criteria of the special use is that no parking is supposed to be within 25 feet of a residential area. Um, their proposed parking, which I'll show you in a moment, is within three feet of a residential district. And then the last waiver is to general use buffer standards. From the east and northern property line, the code requires 15 foot landscape buffer with a six foot high wall. They're asking to reduce those down to three feet to the east with a six foot high PVC fence, and then to the north, four feet with a six foot high PVC fence. Here's the site plan that they are proposing. Let me zoom in. Um, here is the private recreational facility. Again, it's under 2,000 square feet with parking coming, um, two-way parking coming off of Clearview here, and then a one-way exit on West San Miguel with the required um, parking to the Eastern portion of the site. 
Um, staff worked closely with the applicants, trying to encourage them to design a building that was more residential in character to fit into this area because it is on the edge of an existing neighborhood that directly uh, is in the back of commercial development. Um, and, and as you can see from the elevations, scale and massing have a residential character. Um, David showed an aerial, but again, here's the zoning. There are no local or national um, landmarks within the 1,000 foot radius. Um, this property backs right up to the commercial general and the commercial intensive zoning on Southdale Mabry and is right at the edge of the existing neighborhood. Plant High School again is to the south. So it's really kind of at the corner of the existing neighborhood. The property is currently vac vacant as I stated. So the north is a single family house. To the south are the fields of Plant High School. To the west is a back of the commercial strip center. And to the east is a detached single family house. Saying that um, overall the development review and compliance staff did find it inconsistent just based on transportation inconsistent finding because of the access to a local street for non-residential traffic. I'm available for any questions. Do we have any questions from council members? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, who will be presenting uh, and speaking on this? Who is the applicant? Mr. Corson or Mr. Martin? Mr. Martin, you're muted. Please unmute yourself. I'll begin. Um, uh, I'm Billy Martin. I'm the president of the Friend of Four. Um, we are on, uh, coming to you on behalf of uh, Troop Four. Uh, it was established in Tampa in uh, 1916. It's the oldest scout troop um, in the area. Um, we had a uh, permanent facility beginning in um, 1947 that we occupied up until 2013 and lost because of um, just some issues with the church and, and things with BSA. But we come representing our organization and attempt to try to find a permanent home for the scouts of Troop Four. Uh, my grandfather and great-grandfather, Bill Armstead, both uh, were Eagle Scouts and leaders, and I became involved in 2013 to try to help to establish a permanent place for the boards of Troop 4 to meet, develop a tradition of scouting, and grow into the leaders of the community that we've been um, able to successfully bring forward. And we were fortunate enough in the last seven years in our attempt to try to find a area to do this, to discover this property and, and are looking to develop it into a meeting place for the boys to continue the scouting tradition at Troop 4 in South Tampa. Um, and on that, I'm going to invite uh, Ham Jones to give a little more detail on what we're proposing. Good evening, Council. Uh, first, we're going to talk a little about the site, if you know where it's that property is located just to the north of Plant High School, and that road coming by it is San Miguel. Um, the staff said those are not arterial roads, but a very busy road. If you've ever been there in the morning time when school's opening up, all the cars are cutting through there in the afternoons. And it's definitely kind of a cut through road for getting into that neighborhood and getting over to Himes Avenue to go north or go south. Um, so actually, if you stand on the west side of our property and look due west, you're looking directly at South Hill Mabry Highway. So we're about 175 feet, as staff said, from South Hill Mabry. Um, when we started to design this and lay it out with the site plan, we tried to be as sensitive to the neighbors, the neighborhood as we could. That's why we decided to shift the structure as far west as we could to create a very good buffer. And I believe we're gonna be, the structure of the building is gonna be about 59 feet from the property line, going from the east to the west. So uh, if had this been a single family home, we could have been seven feet from the property line. But we Operator just added me. decided to shift that as far west as we could. Um, also from the north, I believe we're gonna be about 34 feet from the property line with the structure. In doing so, that made us park to the east side of the property. And one thing to note, 
we're actually exceeding the parking requirement. Um, also, the, the scale of the building will be very small. It's only about 2,000 square feet, um, which is basically a one-story building. Uh, we thought that would be, make a terrific buffer kind of from the commercial uses to the west going to the residential uses to the east. Um, one thing to keep in mind, this, this property is already zoned a PD for a commercial use, that congregate living facility. So we don't believe we're intensifying the use. We're actually decreasing the intensity of use by going to this meeting space for the uh, troop floor for the, for the scouts to meet. Also keep in mind, we don't meet every night. Um, we kind of follow the school calendar and meet. I think we're, we have plans to meet about four nights a week, I believe is typical use of the property. Um, but we don't meet in the summertime. We don't meet during the day. <clears throat> it's going to be pretty much a pretty low intensity, quiet use of the building. Um, Mr. Newcomb, I see that you um, you signed in. Uh, are you part of the applicant? Yes, I am, and I could not unmute myself at the time, so I, right. I was prevented from, by the moderator. I think they had me as a, a speaker, an outside speaker. So if I could be sworn in left before I speak, that would be great. All right, go ahead. Where in, but I couldn't. Okay, please raise your right hand. Yes, ma'am. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am, because the scout is trustworthy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, continue. Thank you, Mr. Mascalco. All right, Mr. Jones, anything else? Uh, just to kind of finish up, um, we really tried to be as sensitive to the neighbors as we could. Um, we reached out to three different neighborhood groups, not only with the mailings, but I emailed them personally to try to speak with them and email back and forth and offered to meet with them and go over the plans and didn't hear from any of them that they had any objection to it. I don't know if anyone's going to speak tonight against it, but we feel this will be an asset to the neighborhood and to the community. So. All right. Thank you. Uh, I do, I do have a couple of uh, color renderings. If, if I'm able to share the screen, I could just share those and just briefly right. talk about the, um, okay. All right, if, you could state your name, if you could state your name, please, sir. Sam Corson, I have been sworn. Uh, does the, uh, can you Do see the see rendering? Yes, the Boy Scouts Membership Center. Go ahead, yes. sir. Yes. So uh, Troop 4 uh, is, uh, is the oldest uh, Boy Scout troop in the, in the city. Uh, we have over a hundred year history. Uh, we had been sponsored by a long time uh, uh, church uh, that went defunct. Uh, we lost a, a building that we had use of for 50 years, exclusive use of. Uh, so we formed uh, we formed this organization to find a site that where we could have a, a permanent facility for the next hundred years. We in, we intend to occupy this site in perpetuity. Uh, Troop Four has had over 350 Eagle Scouts uh, in our hundred year history. Uh, we've uh, had countless service projects that benefit the community, uh, such as uh, serving Alpha House. Uh, renovations at Oaklawn Cemetery and the Victory Ship. We intend to, like I said, we intend to use this facility uh, for the next hundred years to continue to serve uh, the youth of the, of the community and to and to benefit the, uh, the larger community. Uh, and I would just uh, echo uh, what uh, Mr. Jones says, that this is a less intense use of, of a site that really is a, it's a tough site uh, because it backs up to that commercial and you're right next to Plant High School. Uh, there's not a lot of good uses, uh, but we feel this is just an excellent use for what we uh, want to do, what to do for, you know, for the community and to benefit the, the city in, in general. And uh, I'll turn it over to uh, our current Scoutmaster, Larry Sledge. You can, I can stop my okay. screen. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Just, think, just real quick, um, I am the current Scoutmaster. I'm the current leader of the Boy Scouts. Uh, we have... Um, you know, a number of Boy Scouts as well as Cub Scouts involved in our troop. I do want to say a quick thank you uh, to Mr. Shelby and Councilman Dingfelder for the little civics lesson at the beginning here for all my Scouts who are listening in tonight. 
you know, you all helped me in a great way there. Uh, also acknowledge uh, Councilman Vieira, your past work I've seen with, with other troops. We thank you for that. Um, just wanted everyone to be aware, you know, that, you know, we're here uh, working to build the leaders of tomorrow. Um, I personally was not a scout, but when I got involved with Troop 4, um, my uh, first grade son was invited, who's now a, a junior in high school. I've put all three of my boys uh, through this program because of that. You know, it is just an outstanding program. I, I imagine many of you are familiar already about what scouting does, but Troop 4 is particularly special. And we are doing many great things uh, with these young men. Uh, we appreciate the support we have from the city and founders. And I'm primarily here to be able to answer any questions you might have uh, regarding our uh, ongoing uses of the facility uh, once it is, is uh, constructed. Thank you very much. I guess I'm next. <laughs> this is John Newcomb. I'm a resident at 4201 Bayshore Boulevard, Tampa. I was sworn in, as you saw last. I'm, a, I'm speaking as a former Scoutmaster and former Cubmaster, Scout, Scoutmaster Troop 4 and Cubmaster of Pack 4. I was most involved with both the troop and the pack for the nine years that my son was a Cub Scout and Boy Scout. Uh, I was myself a Scout. I'm an Eagle Scout, as is my brother, and I had great fond memories of that, and I wanted to have my son to have those experiences as well. So I became very involved with scouting. Uh, both in the troop as well as at the council level. Um, I served for two years as scoutmaster, but like many, many troop four uh, leaders and uh, adult leaders, uh, it, it has this infectious quality of getting you to want to remain involved with the troop. So I stay involved when asked from time to time, including times like this. I've been involved with Friends of Four. I've been involved with Eagle Scout uh, um, Boards of Review uh, and um, Scout um, and conferences and uh, have helped with merit badges and things through the years as well. During the time I was most active with the troop, I was also the district chair of the former Gulf Ridge Council's Rough Riders District, which involves scouting in the entire South Tampa area, going from 275 all throughout the city of Tampa. There was countless units, probably close to 40 or 50 units in that time period of troops, posts, uh, venture crews, and packs. And I can state unequivocally that Troop 4 is, in my opinion, it's the top, but it's certainly one of the top three units in, the, uh, in, this, in this area in terms of the uh, leadership, the involvement, and the activities that the boys get involved with. It has, as you told, been continuously chartered for 104 years, making it the longest continuously chartered troop in the southeastern United States to treasure the city of Tampa. While Scoutmaster, Scout projects that, that scouts were involved with while I was Scoutmaster included improvement of local parks. I was particularly proud that my son met with the parks director and several park staff and uh, was involved with the significant renovations of Palmasia Park, uh, including converting it from a, at that point, fairly dormant use to a very active dog park. Uh, brought in, uh, <laughs> Bay News 9 actually featured that that at that, 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 that time. They, they were going to go and show a decrepit park and they were shocked when they came and saw uh, 30 or 40 scouts and others running around working that day uh, and working on a service project. But in addition, Alafai River State Park, as you heard, uh, the Oaklawn Cemeteries, the American Victory Ships, stormwater drainage projects. There's been countless projects that have improved this community as a result of scouts uh, through the years. And that was just in the two years I was scoutmaster. We thought we had a lifetime home over at First Christian Church at the foot of the Davis Island Bridge, uh, but when uh, that, uh, the, 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 that church went uh, defunct and sold to uh, uh, Holy Trinity, uh, uh, the, the charter was they declined to renew our charters. And fortunately, Palmasia Presbyterian welcomed us with open arms. We've been very happy there. Uh, they've been very accommodating. But uh, uh, we're not sure about the long term. You know, we're kind of in moving around in various. Uh, uh, in, 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 we're, we're not sure we're going to keep that home on a permanent basis. So we immediately formed uh, Friends of Four to try to find a, a home that we could have on a permanent basis. Our goal would still be to remain chartered by Palmasia Presbyterian Church, but to uh, have a home that we could know that would never be taken away from us. So I ask you, as council members, uh, to please continue to help 
allow us to shape our local youth to become the good citizens that they have become over the years and to continue to serve our committee. And I thank you very much for your time and op open up for any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Councilman Dingfelder. Thank you. Uh, another disclosure, uh, I know John knew pretty, pretty darn well too, but um, no, I think you guys had us at, uh, at Boy Scouts. Um, we appreciate all the work that, that, that you guys do and, and uh, I think it goes without saying. Uh, my dad uh, uh, is, is an Eagle Scout. Yes, even, he is. Even though I lost him last year. Um, but anyway, yeah. on a serious Mark. note, um, the PD site plan, which I'm looking at, and, and Mr. Jones, you can help me, or actually I might need your help, Kate, with this. The couple of letters we received in opposition or, or with concerns from the neighbors, they didn't speak to Boy Scout facility, but some of them spoke to the, the PD proposed use, which is private recreational facility. So I know that you guys are well intended, that you're going to build a Boy Scout facility, blah, blah, blah. But arguably, what if you went defunct and that PD remained and it said private rec recreational facility? So Kate, what does that, what does that leave us, you know, open to in terms of possibilities? Um, you know, could it be a private club, uh, which ultimately could be a liquor club, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not, I'm not raising this just myself, but one of the letters that I saw in the file mentioned this. So I guess my question is, and this sort of relates back to the, to the previous rezoning that we talked about. Um, I don't see anywhere on on this entire site plan that mentions a Boy Scout facility or youth facility or something like that. Um, I think it would be great between the first and second reading if we could add some additional language that would, you know, uh, attempt to limit this PD use to a, uh, you know, to a Scout facility or a youth facility or something like that. So that way we could give the neighborhood comfort uh, that 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 is the permanent long-term intent of this rezoning. In response to Mr. Dingfelder's question, I would defer to Mary Samaniego since you're asking for testimony from staff. Mary. Uh, Mary Samaniego, their proposed use is private recreational facility, which is the defined use in our code. Um, which reads a privately operated facility providing indoor or outdoor recreation activities, including, but not limited to community clubs and meeting halls, boys and girls, quote unquote, country clubs, golf courses, riding tables, and tennis clubs. So there's this very specific list of sub uses under the private recreational facility club use. So then my question goes back to, thank you, Mary. My question goes back to legal is, could we add a very minor, you know, condition on there that speaks to, you know, Boy Scouts or youth? I'm sure that the petitioners would have no problem with that. Hamilton, uh, Mr. Mr. Newcomb. Absolutely. I, I, I know we would have no problem with that, but I also would mention, I don't know if I'm, am I muted still or no? Uh, yeah, no, we're, we're good. good. You're good. Okay. I would add that uh, Friends of Four is a 501c3 organization. And as a 501c3 organization, if something was to happen, you know, to, we, we can only use our, our uh, for, 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 for charitable uh, civic purposes. But if something was to happen and we were to go defunct, those assets would have to go again to another a uh, charitable organization so they can't they can't go for private you know for private type of use um they would have to be uh, our, our assets would have to be in, in public trust but but i certainly would have no objection i'm sure none of the other uh members who've spoken we, we'd be very happy to limit it to a to a scout hut because that's our intention um but uh, uh the, the we were we were, we thought we were constrained by what the code said that we were when we had our pre pre-application meeting we were told when we described what we wanted to do, they said you are going to have to come in as a private recreational facility. That's that was, but but I I think we'd be very happy to if we can to limit it. Ms. That's well, our, any thoughts? 
Kate Wells, Chief Assistant City Attorney. I'll refer back to the section of the Florida statutes. It's section 70.45, which addresses city council's ability to impose conditions. Um, and there always has to be a relationship between the proposed condition and the impact, you know, how you're intending to use that condition to mitigate the impact of the proposed rezoning. If I can follow up on that. Yes, sir. Council. Um, I think that I think that's an interesting section. It's been referenced twice tonight. So I think just as uh, information to council, I'll, re I'll refer that. I'll get you a copy of that section just so you have it for future reference. Um, but also the, the limitation as staff testified to uh, is, is very specific. And just a reminder that if you put this kind of um, condition on there, even if they agree to do that, um, it, 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 it encumbers the property in a way that the way they'd have to do it, if there is a subsequent purchaser, they have to come in for a change of use. I don't want to testify to that. Maybe Mary Caminiego will confirm this. Um, uh, that they're not, you know, the next owner is not necessarily bound by it. And if they are, that could be considered uh, something problematic uh, for the city down the road. Um, I, I don't want to speculate, but I just want to uh, ask Mary to either confirm or correct me um, as to what I've just stated with regard to changes of use for a subsequent owner. Um, yes, as, as I believe you know, zoning runs with the land, not with ownership. So yeah, if you limit the use to one use or only Boy Scouts, then that's the only use that could be on the property. Um, and then you would um, have to re rezone the property again and uh, to add additional uses and go through this procedure again. Um, I professionally don't recommend that at all. So. Thank you, Council. Thank you very much. Anybody else? All right, if not, Councilman Citro. Mr. Chair, thank you very, very much. Uh, gentlemen, uh, we all know the great things that the Boy Scouts have done and the great history. Uh, you may have seen that this council has given, given out many commendations to Eagle Scouts. Uh, I personally have given one, and uh, hopefully when his brother gets his Eagle Scout project finished, I will give another comment. <laughs> My lodge is also given many um, uh, accolades to Eagle Scouts. Uh, I'm still concerned about the surrounding neighborhoods. Now, we, you had touched on your hours of operation. The prior uses there, I believe it's a, it's a living facility, and normally those people um, are in bed at an early hour. Uh, what hours of operations? What time will you stop your meetings in the evenings? So typically, um, you know, we, we have a range of kids in there on different days of the week that range anywhere from kindergarten to you know, high school. Um, for our oldest scouts, the latest we're likely to be there is 8.30 at night. Um, you know, it's it's certainly conceivable a meeting ends at 8.30 and me and one of the other leaders is still talking in the parking lot at, at a little before nine, but that would be the absolute latest. You know, you go to the younger scouts, um, they're going to be gone long before that on the days that they're there. Great. I, I just want to make sure everybody is living in harmony. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes. yes. Anybody else? Well, just, just one other. I'll, I'll just wrap up the um, my other comment. Um, you know, I, I know that it's very, very, very unlikely, and I agree with Mr. Newcomb and the rest of them. That, you know, hopefully, this troop will be around for another hundred years, and and this will be the building that they'll use. So, I guess I won't get hung up on that. I, the neighborhood did express some concerns. Yeah. Under this use, it could become a an elk club or a moose lodge or something like that, because I believe those types of clubs could also fall into the same category. But I won't obsess about it based upon the uh, wise legal advice we, we have here today. I will compliment you on the design, um, Mr. Jones, et cetera, um, and, I, and also on, on uh, your egress and ingress uh, on clear view. I think it's much, much safer. Um, somebody wants somebody in the neighborhood suggested you come out on on the curve on San Miguel, which I think is totally ridiculous. So um, I, I, I think coming out on the curve view is the right place, and uh, I think it's focused. 
Thank you very much. Anybody else? Great. Anybody for public comment registered to speak on this item, item number eight? No one has registered to speak on this item. All right. Do we have anybody at the Tampa Convention Center? This is Eileen Glossario from Planning and Development, and there's no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. Close, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion to close from Councilmember Miranda and a second from Councilmember Dingfelder. Uh, I'll second. I'll second, and I just wanted to put on the record that there is a letter of support from the Parkland Estates Neighborhood, of, uh, what do they call themselves, Civic Club, in support of this uh, mm. project. Okay, thank you very much. We have a motion from Councilman Miranda, second from Councilman Dingfelder. Roll call vote. Goods? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Sierra? Yes. Dietro? Yes. Maniscaco? Yes. And Dingfelder? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you very much. And thank Mr. Chair, if I may. Mr. Yes, Chair, I just thank you. No, just before I, did, I didn't want to speak during the meeting on my feelings on scouts, but I just we just vote on the oh. motion to close. Sorry. Okay. Thank the you. Close. What was that? What was the vote? It was, this was motion, the motion was to close the public hearing. Okay. Uh, oh boy. Now, we, now we have to vote on it. We're we're messing thank up. You, on thank you, Council. Since we did the, the roll call, okay, disregard. Okay, who would like to read this? Councilman Dinkfelder? Are they asking for any waivers? Yes, sir, they're asking for several waivers. They're found in your staff report. All right, um, I'll move to approve. You know what? I don't seem to have the, the full ordinance in front of me. So I, as much as I support it, ask somebody else to read it. All right, Councilman Seeker. I will be more than happy to take it. Thank you very much. File number REC 20 70. Uh, an ordinance be presented for first reading an ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of uh, 1080 South Clearview Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification PD plan development to PD plan development, private <laughs> recreational facility facility providing an effective date as the petitioners have met the burden of proof. The proposed development as shown on the site plan promotes and encourages development in the appropriate location. Uh, the request of waivers will not substantially interfere or injure the rights of others in those properties will be affected by the waivers and with all waivers included. Second. Who was the second? Councilman Miranda with the second. Uh, I'm wrong. I mean, I, I wasn't second. Someone got the second, but I just want to breathe that. I think you ought to say the, because on this year, you got to say the file number. And I believe you ought to say why the, what are the goals and objective and what are the waivers on your, on your sheet that you have to make it a little bit more stronger. Just Dink, my opinion. All right, Councilor Dingfelder. Yeah, I was the second, and and Joe did mention the file number of uh, 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 REZ twenty seventy three. Nothing. Well, Council, I believe those are. I believe there's also a revision sheet that's associated with this. So if that could be right. done between first and, and second. And I'll include reading. the revision. Thank you, Thank you. party. All right, we have a motion, Councilman Citro, with a second, Councilman Dingfelder. This is a vote. On the motion uh, to read the ordinance, go ahead with the roll call. Boots? Yes. Miranda? Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Citro? Yes. Maniscaco? Yes. And Dingfelder? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on November 5th at 9.30 a.m. Now, now, thank you very much. <laughs> now thank you very much, Council. And, and I just wanted to say just really quick, now that we're finished, and my apologies for that before, I just wanted to thank all y'all with the Scouts for all the wonderful work that you do. My son did uh, Cub Scouts for five or six years, and, you know, some of the best friends he has now he got from Scouts, and Scouting is all about values. And, um, you know, that's why I think we're all, all of us at strong supporters of, of, uh, of scouting 
it's a, it's just a great program for young people and uh, it really implements uh, good good values in young people that we need more of in our society today uh, so just thank you guys amen thank you so much appreciate thank that you. thank you great thank evening you. good night good night Go all right item number nine we have mr robles uh, back on we'll swear him in again and let's see there we are please raise your right hand do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth I will. Yes. thank you and the clerk's office did not receive any written comments on this item thank you very much go ahead mary Thank you. This is a uh, case number REZ 2059. It's a rezoning request from Seminole Heights Residential to Seminole Heights PD for DCHAT single family dwellings at the property located at 5501 North <laughs> Street. I defer to David Day, please. I did, uh, can I share my screen, please? Go ahead. There we go. Um, <clears throat> Good evening, council members. David Hay again with your planning commission staff. I have been sworn. Uh, this next uh, case is located uh, within the central Tampa planning district and more specifically the old Seminole Heights uh, neighborhood. Uh, it is also located within the Seminole Heights urban village. There is a policy direction which guides development in these urban villages is uh, their specific policy language in the comp plan regarding urban villages. Uh, there is one correction. There is a reference to the West Tampa urban village uh, that was included in the report uh, and that is not correct, but all the other information. Um, the subject site is in proximity to transit. There is uh, transit just to the south on East Hillsborough Avenue. Uh, East Hillsborough Avenue is a transit emphasis corridor the subject site is not located within an evacuation zone and the closest park is Giddens Park, which is approximately a half mile to the southwest of the subject site. Here we have uh, the aerial, you can see the commercial uses to the south along Hillsborough and then you, it goes into single family detached on the north. This is actually uh, the kind of like an access road to the Walmart Supercenter on Hillsborough Avenue. This is the parking lot for that. Here we have the uh, adopted future land use map. Uh, the subject site and all this property in the tan color is that residential 10 future land use category immediately to the south and at the end where the Walmart is, it's all in that red is all the community commercial 35. So that allows consideration of the CI uh, uses. On the south side of Mohawk, there is some community mixed use 35 that does allow consideration uh, for non-residential uh, uses up to commercial general. The Planning Commission staff has reviewed the application and found no adverse impacts to the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, this portion of North 15th Street has an existing density of 6.75 dwelling units per acre, which is under the density allowed under that residential 10 future land use category. The plan development is proposing two single family residents at an overall density of 10 uh, units per acre. That's consistent with the residential 10 future land use category. Uh, uh, also, the request is consistent with policy direction in the plan uh, regarding um, infill housing. Uh, the site is consistent with those urban village policies that I had mentioned previously. And in conclusion, the proposed plan development would be developed form, height, and scale of the surrounding residential uses. The proposed rezoning supports the comprehensive plan. It would not alter the character or development pattern of this portion of the old Seminole Heights uh, neighborhood. Furthermore, the request would create additional housing opportunities within that identified urban village. So based on all those considerations, your Planning Commission staff does recommend to you this evening that the proposed Plan development uh, for Seminole Heights be found consistent with the provisions of the Imagine 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Seminiego. Can you please share my screen? Okay, thank you. Um, again, this is a PD request um, for detached single family residential. 
Um, the property is located at 5501 North 15th Street. It's currently vacant. Um, it's at the northeast corner of 15th Street and East Mohawk Avenue. Um, the surrounding uses are detached single family to the northeast west in the Seminole Heights Residential Zoning District, and then a retail use to the south across East Mohawk Avenue in the Seminole Heights Commercial Intensive Zoning District. Um, <clears throat> the minimum lot width for the SHRS Zoning District, which the property is currently located, is 50 feet wide and 5,000 square feet in area. The applicant is proposing two lots that are 45 feet wide and 100 feet deep for a total area of 4,500 square feet. That um, 40 feet, 45 feet wide and 4,500 square feet is smaller than the smallest uh, Euclidean zoning district in the city, some of the heights. So therefore the only way, <coughs> excuse me, the only way to ask for lots of this size is through the PD process. Oops. Here is um, the Site plan of the subject property, again, two single family um, lots, 100 feet wide, 45 feet each in width. Driveways coming off of North um, 15th Street. Um, they have comp they've shown all the required tree tables and here are building elevations of the proposed development for massive scale only. Areas and aerials of the subject property. There are no local or national, <coughs> excuse me, historic landmarks within a thousand feet. Um, it's just a block to the north of East Hillsborough Avenue. East Hillsborough Avenue um, runs east west and is in the Seminole Heights Commercial Intensive Zoning District. And then this is just to the north of that boundary line coming into the RS um, Zoning District of Seminole Heights. Um, because they're asking to create lots less than 50 feet in width, we've done the analysis. Um, this this lot is not part of a platted subdivision. It's a meets and bounds legal description. Um, however, we analyzed the overall area included 264 zoning lots, 100% of which are lots 50 feet or greater. Um, pursuant to the de existing development pattern, the subject lot contains seven total zoning lots. 100% of which are all 50 feet or greater as well. Similarly, for the block face and the subject lot, um, all lots are at least 50 feet wide. There are no lots in the study area, nor in the block that are less than 50 feet wide. Um, you can see on this map, any lot that would be less than 50 feet wide would be this light kind of grayish blue color light blue, gray, or light gray, there are no properties in the entire study area that dip down to a lot width that is uh, similar to the 45 foot lot width the applicant is requesting. <clears throat> Here is a photograph, I apologize, of the subject property. This is a vacant building to the north, the back of a uh, retail or automotive use to the south. To the west is a detached single family house and to the east is a vacant piece of property. Saying that the development review compliance staff did find this inconsistent with the city of Tampa land development code. Um, again, reference my findings in your staff report for um, the planning design and development department related to the existing development pattern in the immediate area. I'm available for any questions. Okay, uh, Councilman Goose. And then Councilman Moran. San Diego, can you give me those numbers again on the 50 foot lots in that area? There are no lots that are less than 50 feet wide. No lots. None. Councilman Moran. I, I, I've heard enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Councilman, I'm sorry, Mr. Robles, if you'd like to present. Yes, thank you, Council. Uh, Mary, thank you very much. Um, I just, if I could bring up two exhibits um on my screen so if you guys will just bear with me ladies and gentlemen bear with me one second mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. 
Um, in researching this property, you'll see the subject property. Um, it appears to, to us that there was a 10 foot taking to construct what appears to be the right out turn lane on that portion of Mohawk to the side. That appears to be a 10 foot taking. Um, we did uh, research with uh, Barbara Lynch with the city of Tampa. Unfortunately, the, the, uh, some of the old deeds where they, where they um, um, did some of these takings, she, can, she cannot find that taking, but obviously if you look at the parcel, you can see where there was 10, there was approximately 10 feet removed off of that. So what I I'm, would uh, gratefully ask council to consider is that is to give me the credit for the turn lane taking, which would have gotten me to a fifth to a hundred feet in lieu of the 90 feet, which created the 45 foot wide lots. Mm -hmm. Additionally, um, there was one point uh, to note there. Um, and I, Mary, I don't think that you covered that, but um, at the last minute, natural resources um, ask us to submit two alternative or two um, alternative designs for a 128 inch tree. And um, we have we have um, submitted that to natural resources. And I do have copies tonight if you wish to look at it. If you look within the report, marriage report, it does speak to that. And that has been provided to natural resources. Thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, go ahead, sir. I have, I have no more to my presentation. Thank you. All right. Any questions for the applicant? Councilman Dingfelder. You're muted, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure if it's for the applicant or if staff or legal, but I do believe there's somewhere in the code that speaks to if a property has been historically been subject to a taking uh, that creates some type of exception in terms of zoning it, zoning and, and that sort of thing. Anybody help me out, Mary? There's a provision in the code, I can't cite the code section, but it relates to setbacks of an existing building when there is a taking, which would make that building non-conforming. It's not related to the ability to further subdivide a piece of property. Um, so did, so that uh, let's just assume there's a taking Mary, um, or there had been a taking. May, let me stop you there, Mr. Dinkfelder. I want to be clear on that before you make any assumptions. The question is, what is the evidence in the record with regard to the taking? Okay. So I, if it, either the staff is able to opine to that or if the, uh, um, uh, Petitioner certainly has any evidence one way or the other. And then the question then comes in is actually then what is the relevance of that? But certainly the determination, the term taking has certain definitions. And the question is whether it meets the definition of what took place as being a taking right. or was right. there compensation? I, I, won't, I won't assume anything at this point, but, but let me just further my legal inquiry. Um, isn't there somewhere else, Mary or, or Kate, that speaks to, um, if a taking creates a non-conforming use? Not, not Mary San Diego, not that I'm familiar with. And, and again, I would, I'm not sure if this was a takings. A takings is a legal. Um, well, I, I'm in an eminent either, domain. This could I have mean, been a right of way acquisition for road widening. Right, I mean, that's, that's how I'm using the term taking, an eminent domain. I don't mean a, yeah, I'm just I'm cautioning you there's a difference in zoning for zoning law. And I think until there's evidence of either to speculate would be inappropriate at this time. Um, Mr. Robles offered some evidence. Um, I don't know how conclusive it is. Do we have anybody from transportation on this call on this uh, call to still? No. Hmm. Mary. Do we have anybody else? Transportation? Somebody from transportation should be available during the entire meeting. 
Adam Clerk, is uh, somebody from transportation uh, registered online? Um, is it Jonathan Scott? Yes. Yes. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's, he's still on. He just needs to unmute himself and show his video. Can you pull him up then, please, for counsel. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Until we can get Jonathan on, Mr. if you don't mind. Uh, Ms. San Diego, you, 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 you alluded to that there, there is no, uh, let's say, rule in reference to this alleged taking or immigrant loan as it relates to this residential property, correct? Correct. This, the, the right of way acquisition did not make a non conforming lot. This lot is conforming with the current zoning district. He's, at, he's requesting to further subdivide and create two lots that don't conform. Again, all of the lots in that particular area, plus the area, are 50 or greater, correct? Correct. All right. Do we have Jonathan Scott on the line? All right. That, that's all right. I'm good. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. Uh, do we have anybody for public comment on this item, item number nine? No one has registered to speak on this item. And is there anyone at the convention center to speak on item number nine, REZ 20-59? I'm Lindy Osario from Planning and Development, and there's no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. All right. Is there anything else from council members? Anything else from the applicant? Um, yes, if I could just make make one uh, further point. Under the under the uh, form based code in Seminole Heights, um, just the, in general character, 90 foot lots in Seminole Heights are not characteristic of Seminole Heights. There are, however, uh, a substantial amount of lots in Seminole Heights under the uh, under the lot of record that were platted as under 50 feet. I realize they are not in this particular um, you know marriage formula of lots, but there are lots in Seminole Heights that are less than 50 feet. All See, right. in, in, and I and I don't. The, the C, the commercial intensive lots, I don't think should be considered in the analysis as well. Um, but other than that, I, if it, if it, uh, if it please, um, I'll ask the council's um, favor in, in um, approving this fee. All right, anything else? Uh, no, sir, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anything else from count? Ms. Wells. Thank you. Um, just because there's been discussion this evening about regulatory takings, I wanted to point counsel to section 27-295 of the zoning code. It's entitled non-conforming lots. And uh, if you go to subsection B2, um, and I'll just read it directly, it says combination not required for non-conformity created by public taking or court order. Where the non-conforming lots were created by public taking, action or as a result of a court order, a combination of the lot shall not be required. So as Ms. Samaniego testified earlier this evening, the issue with regard to regulatory takings uh, doesn't really apply to this situation as the lot before you is conforming. But I knew, I knew there was something in there. Thank you. Okay, is there a motion to close? All right, we have a motion to close from Councilman Good, second from Councilmember Miranda. Any objection? Hearing no objection and by unanimous consent, the hearing is now closed. Councilmember Goods, would you like to read item number nine? Mr. Chairman, I'm 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 not in favor of this particular item. So okay. somebody else wants to move. Councilmember Carlson, would you like to read item number nine? Sure, I'll read it. Okay. Um, file number REZ 20-59, ordinance being presented for first reading consideration, ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 5501 North 15th Street in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification SHRS, Seminole Heights residential single family to SHPD. Seminole Heights plan development, residential, single family, detached, providing effective date. 
second. We have a and second. Is there is there anything you wish to add in regard to um, language about um, the uh, zoning or the comprehensive right. plan? Do you have that available to you? Um, trying to pull some things up here. Um, I think that the that the uh, petitioner met their burden of um, showing consistency with the surrounding area, upgrading the um, the uh, landscape of the area and um, conforming to the um, land use policies. Anybody else have anything else I want to add? I, I'm, I'm just going to say that uh, I understand the need for housing. I understand the need, but this is my opinion, just a splitting of a lot with a different attachment to it. But uh, it's got to stop if you're going to put 49 foot lots and 47 foot lots in West Tampa, not allow them everywhere else. I'm going to tell you that I'll be fighting from now on till my hair comes back. We got to treat the city in total one way or the other either no more splitting anywhere or splitting everywhere but it cannot be done the way we're doing it thank you very much all right we have a motion from council member carlson we have a second from council member vieira roll call vote vieira yes carlson yes Dietro. yes miranda no dingfelder no foods so, no. and Maniscaco. Yes. Motion carry with Miranda, Dingfelder, and Goods voting no. Second reading and adoption will be held on November 5th at 9.30 a.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is item number 10. Mr. Bricklemeyer, I assume, if you would turn on your camera and unmute yourself and we will swear you in. And we have a David Bell. Do we have anybody else for item number 10? Mr. Bell, you are muted. Madam Clerk, is there anybody else to speak on this yeah. item? Mr. Clinton, there, he is. there he is. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. yes. Thank you. And the clerk's office did not receive any written comments on this item. Mr. Brickamar, are you uh, unmuted? I think so. Can you all hear me? All right. Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, Mary, right. go ahead. It was telling me the organizer had muted me. Sorry. Go ahead, Mary. You're good. Thank you, sir. Um, REZ 2074, it's a rezoning request for 624 South McDill Avenue from PD to PD to medical office and business professional office. I defer to Mr. Hay. Good evening, council members. David Hay again with your planning commission staff. I have been sworn we remain in the um, central Tampa uh, planning district uh, for this next case, more specifically um, the Palmacia Pines uh, neighborhood. Uh, there is transit uh, located in proximity to the site at South McDill and West Swan Avenue. That's served by Hart Route 19. The closest public park is Sims Park, which is about one fourth of a mile to the southeast. And the subject site is located within the level C evacuation zone. Here we have the aerial. This, uh, this is the subject site. We've got uh, McDill. There's a bunch of commercial uh, office uses scattered throughout uh, north of Swan. South of Swan, it immediately goes down to a more uh, single family detached uh, pattern. Uh, I believe these uh, duplexes behind there, but this area is predominantly um, north of Swan, either townhomes, office, commercial, as a whole mixture of uses. Uh, here we have the future land use map, and you can see the subject site has two future land use designations, uh, approximately uh, point half, well, actually half of the uh, parcel, the uh, western part, 0.22 acres, 
is that community mixed use 35 that's represented by this uh, pinkish color. Uh, the eastern uh, side is um, residential 35. That's also 0.22 uh, acres in size. Yes. Behind, again, it's also res 35 in this brown color. Then you get back to uh, the public, which is represented by the blue. Um, and red is the community commercial 35. This is, I believe, uh, Memorial Hospital. South of Swan, you immediately drop down to a residential six, large lot residential. And then it starts picking up again south of Morrison into a residential 10. Uh, future land use uh, pattern. Um, the proposed office building is a use that can be considered within the community mixed use 35 category. Again, the eastern portion of the subject site is within that R35. Parking is placed within the area in the rear, a designated uh, residential 35, and the proposed office structure is within the portion uh, at the front of the site, designated community mixed use 35. And again, uh, this area is uh, predominantly mixed in pattern with commercial and office uses. The Given the commercial character of this portion of South McDill Corridor, the Planning Commission staff has determined that the proposed plan development would be within character and scale uh, to that development. The proposed office building is uh, is located within uh, a mixed use land use category. There is specific policy direction within the plan that talks about the form of that mixed use. The proposed office building is placed close to the sidewalk on South McDill Avenue and parking is again is in the rear. Uh, they're encouraged to, buildings are encouraged to engage the public uh, realm. Uh, this, uh, this building is oriented and activates uh, ground floor uh, toward McDill, and it addresses those uh, policies. The plan development attempts to address policies in the comprehensive plan that promote public safety and accessibility. The plan development proposes a pedestrian pathway along the north portion of the site that connects the parking lot to the building entrance and the sidewalk on South McDill Avenue. This pathway will provide safe and accessible access for pedestrians. Thus, it would be consistent with policy direction in the plan. Based on all that, the Planning Commission staff does recommend to you this evening that the proposed plan development be found consistent with the provisions of the Imagine 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Mary, you're, mu you're muted. I'm sorry, sir. They're asking for a redevelopment of an existing PD. This existing PD was rezoned last year in 2019. It was case number REZ 1980. Um, they are now coming forward with a new PD um, site plan for a 9,096 square foot building for medical office and or business professional office. Um, the existing building that is 8,500 square feet or manufacturing and retail use will be demolished. Um, the property is located one lot to the north of the South McDill Avenue, West Swan Avenue intersection. It is surrounded by retail uses and office uses to the north, south, and west in the CG Zoning District, the multifamily development to the east in the RM24 Zoning District. The required parking based on the most intensive uses of the building for medical office is 53 parking spaces required and 45 are being provided. This is resulting in a 15% parking waiver reduction. Here's the site plan as proposed. Here's the building. There's parking underneath the building, which is cantilevered over and then um, surface parking to the rear. There's one correction in the staff report regarding the two waivers that are requested. Um, one again is the 15% parking reduction. The other waiver is requesting, and I'll correct it for the record, to reduce the required use buffer um, along the east property line from 15 feet with a six foot CMU wall, it should say to three feet with an eight foot CMU wall. 
Here's the building elevations that are proposed that are in your site plan for your consideration, City Council. Again, the parking is underneath. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. And there's two stories of building over. Here is a, the existing PD. Um, again, as David said, it's on Swan and McDill Avenue. There's commercial uses and commercial zoning up and down Swan, as well as McDill. Once you get south of Swan, it starts running into residential. <clears throat> to the north is a retail use and to the south is an office use. Um, to the west is a bar, a restaurant, and to the east is um, town hall, a semi-detached semi single family um, along Swan. Overall, the development review did find this inconsistent because of the parking waiver reduction of 15% based on transportation's finding that are in your staff report for your consideration. That concludes my presentation, City Council. Are there any questions for Mary? All right, hearing none, Mr. Brickelmeyer. Good evening, Council. Clayton Brickelmeyer, uh, ordinarily 601 North Ashley Drive, coming to you tonight from my garage slash music room. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mary uh, and David, for your presentations. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to try not to repeat what they said. Uh, you may recall that we were in front of you last year uh, with the idea that we were going to rehabilitate the existing industrial building. Uh, once you all said yes, thank you for that, uh, the architect and everyone got to work and it was determined that that was not going to work out after all. And so what we have now is what's in front of you, uh, which, you know, is an attractive, uh, more modern design, which is a, a positive thing, I think. Uh, we're happy with staff report, uh, especially just noting uh, Mary's change to that one waiver. So I'm just going to talk briefly about the two waivers. Uh, the youth buffer waiver was approved uh, in the previous PD, and that's because uh, that wall, that eight-foot wall has been there since time out of mind. Uh, we're simply asking to extend that wall to the south, which maintains our buffer, the buffer that's always been there between us and the uh, multifamily to our east or the townhouse to our east. Um, the parking waiver, uh, just a few things on that. We've got, this building is a 0.46 FAR. Uh, as David said in his presentation, um, we're CMU 35 on the front half. That would have been, we would have been able to go up to a two with bonus density. And even in the, um, the back half land use category, we would have been a 0.6. Even having said all that, we could only manage a 0.46 and we still have to ask for 15% reduction. Uh, given all of that, I, I think it's pretty reasonable. I, I'll be putting into evidence as I will always be doing on these uh, parking waiver issues, my little survey that I did of surrounding jurisdictions and other national jurisdictions that establish pretty much a national standard that five spaces per thousand is the standard um, medical office parking ratio. We in Tampa have a six per thousand. Uh, this would meet five per thousand, so this would be allowable um, pretty much everywhere else that I've looked. Um, the other thought on the parking waiver is, as Planning Commission noted, we are very close to a couple bus stops that are on bus route 19. You're also intentionally, the, the part of the beauty of this location is its uh, proximity to Memorial Hospital. Uh, for those reasons, we feel like we satisfy uh, 27139 waiver criteria. Uh, I think this is a really good project and David Bell and I are available for questions. Do we have any questions for the applicant? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Hearing none, do we have any public comment, Madam Clerk? Uh, anybody registered to speak or um, live at the convention center? No one has registered to speak on this item. I need to study of planning and development, and there's no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else from council? Uh, if not, I would like a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. We have a motion closed from Orlando uh, Councilman Goods. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Citro. Citro. Is there anybody opposed to closing the public hearing? Hearing none, with no um, objection and by unanimous consent, the <laughs> public hearing is closed. Council member Goods, would you mind taking item number 10? Yes, Mr. Chairman. File number REZ 20-74. Board members in for first reading consideration. 
and known as rezoning property in the general vicinity of 624 South McDill Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in Section 1 of Zone District Classification PD Plan Development, Medical Office and Business Slash Professional Office to PD Plan Development, Medical Office and Business Slash Professional Office providing effective date. Second. We have a second from Councilman Veer, Mr. Shelby. Yes, just that if you could add the additional language um, with regard to um, the, the code and the comprehensive plan. And also there's a revision sheet, uh, Ms. Samaniego, uh, I believe has in the staff report, if we could make that part of the motion as well. Uh, All right. Moving on, it's uh, REZ 20 S 74. Uh, the applicant has met the burden of proof to provide competent and substantial evidence that the development is conditioned and shown on the site plan is consistent with the coverage plan uh, in city code. I find that the requested waivers uh, do not ever affect impact their public health, safety, and general welfare. Uh, Thank you, it. sir. That's Thank it. you, sir. And the, and the revision sheet, is that correct, sir? Yes, sir, and the revision sheet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a motion from Councilman Goods. It was a second by Councilman Vieira. Is that correct? Yeah, no, I, I like to withdraw the second. He lost me at general welfare. I'm joking. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Just for the record, are you still keeping the second? I'll risk it. Very good. Thank you. Let's have a roll call vote, please. Citro? Yes. Felder. Yes. Carlson? Yes. Goods? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Vieira? Yes. And Maniscalco? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on November 5th at 9.30 a.m. Thank you very much. Uh, the final item of the evening uh, has uh, a little bit of public comment and uh, could be a little lengthy. Would anybody like to take a short break or would you like to keep on? Keep on. All right. yeah. we'll I'm fine on. with that. All right. Item number 11. Mr. Brickemeyer is complete. Gone. Yep. All right. We have everybody here for item number 11. All is that right. true? Okay. Ms. Corbett, is everybody there who's supposed to be? Uh, no, Mr. McLaren is logged in. Uh, we also have Judge Case, the magistrate. Madam Clerk, did you get that? I believe Judge Case is trying to log in right now. Yes, ma'am. I want to go to the couch, too. Yes, sure. Yes, Hold on. I need to walk behind you. In the interest of time, Council Scott McLaren is from my office is, is sitting in the same room, so we are happy to uh, get sworn together so we can get on with the proceedings. <coughs> He's getting in now. There he is. All right, we have a. Uh... Everyone on here, okay? Uh, please raise your right hand to be sworn in. Sir? Please, please raise your right hand. Jim Case, your right hand, there you go. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I yes. do. Thank you, and the clerk's office did receive written comments on this item. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Um, who would begin? Ms. Johnson Velez? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Um, and members of City Council, for the record, Susan Johnson Velez, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Also present this evening is David Harvey, Assistant City Attorney in our litigation practice group. This item is on tonight's agenda based upon a special magistrate's recommendation from a request for relief filed by KR Tampa Trust 2019 LLC, who I'll, I'll refer to as KR Tampa pursuant to section 70.51, otherwise known as the Florida Land Use and Environmental Dispute Resolution Act. I wanna make a few brief comments before providing a history of this application and the details of the proposed settlement. 
So unlike the standard rezoning applications you've considered earlier this evening, anytime city council considers a settlement proposal, your role is legislative and allows council to consider items outside of the city's land development code and comprehensive plan, including but not limited to the impact and public interest resulting from the proposed settlement. After I conclude my presentation, you will hear briefly from retired judge Jim Case, who was retained by the city and KR Tampa to be the special magistrate. Once Judge Case confirms the mediation process that we followed and his recommendation, you will then hear from city staff, planning commission staff, the applicant, the public, and then provide the applicant with an opportunity for rebuttal. And finally, as you consider the testimony and evidence entered into the record of tonight's hearing, please remember that although the special magistrate's recommendation is a public record, Actions or statements of representatives for the city and for KR Tampa are evidence of an offer to compromise and inadmissible in the proceeding. So at your February 13th, 2020 meeting, city council denied the rezoning from IG Industrial General to PD plan development, which would have allowed the development of a multifamily project containing 240 dwelling units within four buildings and a clubhouse. Thereafter, KR Tampa filed a request for relief on March 13, 2020, which alleged that KR Tampa had met its burden in establishing consistency with comprehensive plan and compliance with the land development code. No waivers or exceptions were requested. In addition to the request for relief, KR Tampa also served the city with another separate legal action in circuit court containing two counts. The first count was a petition for writ of certiorari seeking to quash city council's decision to deny the application, asserting that the decision was not supported by competent substantial evidence and departed from the essential requirements of law. And the second count was a complaint seeking damages, attorney's fees, costs, and interest under 42 USC section 1983, claiming a violation of equal protection. Air Tampa has not indicated the amount of damages they are seeking other than to allege damages in excess of the jurisdictional amount of $30,000. On April 7, 2020, KR Tampa and the city submitted a joint motion for stay to the circuit court requesting an order staying the litigation until the conclusion of the 7051 proceedings. The circuit court has entered an agreed order on that motion on April 9, 2020, and the stay in litigation remains in place at this time. Now, turning your attention back to the procedural history of this evening's hearing with respect to the 7051 proceeding, when the request for relief was originally filed with the city, my office provided council with a memorandum describing the administrative proceeding under section 70.51 of the Florida statutes. It involves a two-step process. Step one of the process requires the special magistrate to conduct an informal mediation during which the city and KR Tampa consider alternative developments responsive to council's decision to deny the application. In this case, the special magistrate conducted the step one informal mediation on June 2nd, 2020. The parties were not able to reach agreement at this mediation session and agreed to proceed to step two of the administrative process. In step two, the special magistrate holds a hearing to consider the facts and circumstances set forth in the request for relief to determine whether the city council's action this past February is unreasonable or unfairly burdens the property and the special magistrate conducted the step two hearing on July 10th of 2020. Per the statute, the special magistrate then had 14 days to prepare and file a written recommendation with all parties or by July 24th of 2020. At the conclusion of the hearing on July 10th, the special magistrate asked the parties to submit their respective proposed recommendations by July 17th and also reminded us that per the statute, the occurrence of the step two hearing did not preclude us from entering into an agreement as to the permissible use of the property prior to the special magistrate entering a recommendation. So both parties submitted proposed recommendations to the special magistrate and in its proposed recommendation, KR Tampa included another settlement proposal and asked that the magistrate include their proposal in his recommendation. So the proposal represented the, th the third reduction in density by KR Tampa and is reflected in the project before you this evening. On August 5th, 2020, the parties had a final meeting with the special magistrate in order to give the neighborhood participants the opportunity to comment on the alternative development in accordance with the statutory requirements. So the project before you this evening is different than what was denied in February and so is your role tonight. 
As I mentioned at the outset, you are considering a settlement proposal and thus your action tonight on the settlement is legislative. The previous site plan again proposed 240 units in four buildings and a clubhouse. When council previously considered the rezoning application, three of the buildings were three stories and one of the buildings was four stories. The denial was based in part upon KR Tampa's failure to meet its burden of proof establishing compliance with coastal management element objective 1.1, its failure to adequately mitigate the impact on shelter space, concerns over grading and incompatibility with the immediate surrounding community. The site plan for your consideration this evening proposes a clubhouse and a total of 205 units located within four buildings. One of the three story buildings has been reduced to two stories with a maximum height of 35 feet and the four story building has been reduced to three stories. So now this development has three three story buildings and one two story building. Finally, KR Tampa has offered the following additional conditions to increase the buffering and screening by increasing the required buffer area to the east of building four from five feet to 15 feet and installation of a six foot fence with perimeter plantings along the entirety of the southern and eastern property lines. We've also offered hurricane evacuation improvements in the form of two bus shelters at existing bus stops at the intersection of Manhattan Avenue and McCoy Street. And finally, they've offered to provide private transportation evacuation service to residents of the proposed development following the issuance of a mandatory evacuation order applicable <coughs> to the site. If the revised site plan is approved this evening, I would ask that the conditions offered by KR Tampa be added to the site plan between first and second reading. So in a regular rezoning or quasi judicial hearing, again, like all the other hearings you've held this evening, city council looks solely at whether the applicant has demonstrated by competent substantial evidence that the project meets the city's regulations and is consistent with the comprehensive plan. But because this is a settlement proposal, there are other factors that city council must take into consideration, including the fact that if the settlement proposal is approved, the lawsuit pending in case number 20 CA 002473 in the 13th Judicial Circuit will be dismissed with prejudice with each party bearing its own attorney's fees and costs. Pursuant to section 70.5121, city council has three options this evening. After hearing all the evidence and testimony with respect to the proposed rezoning and revised site plan, and after taking into consideration the other relevant matters in the pending litigation, City Council may accept the special magistrate's recommendation by adopting a motion approving the development proposal and then proceed to implement the recommendation. And in this case, implementation of the special magistrate's recommendation would require Council to place the ordinance on first reading. A second reading on the ordinance would still be required. On the other hand, if City Council determines that KR Tampa has failed to meet its burden and after taking into consideration the other relevant matters in the pending litigation, then City Council may reject the Special Magistrate's recommendation. And finally, City Council, <clears throat> excuse me, may modify the Special Magistrate's recommendation with KR Tampa's acceptance of the modifications to proceed to implement the modified recommendation. <clears throat> excuse me. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have um, and if there are none at this time, I will turn the presentation over to Jim, Judge Case, and then you'll hear from city staff, planning commission, the applicant, the public, and rebuttal. Any, any questions? questions? Um, all right, um, Judge Case. Judge Case, go ahead, sir. You're muted, sir. Judge, you have to unmute yourself. Just click on the microphone icon to unmute yourself. There we go. All right, go ahead, sir. Is that better? Yes, sir. Okay. I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to address the council with regard to your agenda item number 11 tonight, uh, identified as REX 19-94, KR Tampa Trust 2019. LLC versus the city of Tampa. By way of introduction, I am Judge James Case, a former sixth judicial circuit judge for over 22 years. 
a current senior judge for the state of Florida and for the past 14 years, an alternative dispute resolution practitioner who handles mediations, arbitrations, and special magistrate appointments. As such, I've been retained by Mr. Scott McLaren, counsel for trust, and Ms. Susan Johnson Velez, senior assistant city attorney for the city of Tampa to serve as a special magistrate in the Florida statute section 70.51 proceeding for this matter. It is important to note that I was not involved in the original proceedings when Trask went before the city and council on February 13th, 2020. The section 70.51 proceeding was commenced by Trask filing its FLUDRA, Florida Land Use and Environmental Dispute Resolution Act, demand for relief dated March 13th, 2020, seeking to resolve its dispute with the city of Tampa over the denial of rezoning application REZ 1994. The applicant trust also requested that a special magistrate be appointed, that a fluter hearing take place, and that all other requirements of the fluter process be satisfied. City of Tampa's attorneys agreed with this request and to the proceedings. In your, material, in your materials, you have a copy of my report dated July 10th, which recommends that the city approve the mediated settlement between Trask and the city of Tampa. It also outlines the extensive process, which was followed in the section 70.51 proceedings. As your magistrate, I would like to address tonight my reflection on the process and ask that any project specific questions be directed to your counsel. Over my career, I've handled dozens and dozens of land use cases, both on the bench and in alternative dispute resolution proceedings. I've witnessed years and years of protracted litigation, costly and frustrating development delays, angst amongst contingent property owners, and of course, a uh, consequence of some huge legal bills. However, I've been continually impressed by the practicality and the inclusive nature of the process under section .51 and was delighted to be asked by Ms. McCart and Ms. Uh, johnson Velez to participate in this matter. The beauty of the 70.51 process is that it starts with a mediation between the parties, with non-parties, members of the public, invited, present, and able to provide candid testimony. In this case, the City of Tampa noticed the required contingent property owners and many others who might have an interest to participate in, and the participation was made much easier using the COVID-driven uh, Zoom online platform. I can honestly tell you that I've never conducted a virtual 70.51 hearing before, but it worked great. This mediation was held on June 2nd, 2020. An important note, as you are probably aware, in court-related mediations, the process is confidential and closed to outside parties. In this case, all interested parties had the opportunity to listen to council's presentations, provide their input, and listen to the various negotiations. We had two non-party members of the public participate in the mediation. This could never happen in a conventional mediation in the court system. The next step in a section 70.51 process is a public hearing where counsel from both sides provide their legal arguments and evidence, and again, non-party members of the public are welcome to appear and did. The hearing was held virtually on July 10th and using the Zoom line platform and two members of the public participated. Section 70.51 then provides that absent a settlement agreement after the hearing, all the testimony and evidence and reviewing, and reviewing the prior cases the special magistrate is required to issue a decision within 14 days. But the statute also provides that the parties can and should continue their negotiations until the time that the final opinion is published. In this case, counsel did indeed reach a settlement, which was communicated to the special master before a decision was rendered. With that mediated settlement, another public meeting was held on August 5th via the Zoom platform. Prior to that meeting, the proposed settlement terms were disclosed and the non-party members of the public were again invited to attend and provide comments, which they did. I found this entire process to be extremely beneficial. I listened carefully to all sides of the rezoning request and to the concerns of the non-party members of the public. And then I issued my final written recommendations regarding the mediated settlement on August 10th, 2020. 
two, two important things to please remember. First, at this point, this is not a normal land use proceeding. It is a section 70.51 proceeding in which the special magistrate makes a report to the city council. And second, and listen carefully to the concerns of those in favor of and in opposition to the project, even after concessions have been made by Trask in the final mediated settlement. In all mediations, there is a give and take and no one gets everything they want. But as I stated publicly, the process was richer and the settlement offer was substantial and this would not have happened without the input of the non-party members of the public that participated. And I thank them for their participation. At this point, as your special magistrate, I recommend that the city council rule favorably, favorably on the mediated settlement in this case, and that they issue a development order approving the rezoning of trash property as outlined in my written recommendations of August 10th, 2020. And I thank you for the opportunity to serve the city of Tampa and your attention this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, who will be next? Uh, city staff will be next. All right, Mary. Thank you, Mary Samaniego, Planning, Design, and Development Coordination. Um, this is formal case REZ 1994. Again, it's a rezoning request from Industrial General to Plan Development for multifamily residential. Um, the city legal department outlined the proposed changes between um, the previous case and what is before you tonight. Um, briefly, they are reducing the number of maximum dwelling units from 240 units to 205, reduction of, of the building height of building four from three stories to two stories, and from building height from building two to four stories to three stories. Increase in the buffering and screening as follows, increase the required buffer area to the east of building four from five feet to 15 feet, an installation of a six foot fence with perimeter plantings along the entirety of the southern and eastern property lines. Hurricane evacuation improvements in the form of two bus shelters at existing bus stops at the intersections of Manhattan Avenue and McCoy Street. And lastly, provide private transportation evacuation service to residents of the proposed development following issuance of a mandatory evacuation order applicable to the site. There are no waivers being requested. The development review and compliance staff did find this consistent. Here is an aerial photograph of the surrounding area. Again, the property is currently zoned industrial general with a longstanding warehouse manufacturing use. There are um, the RS50 zoning district subdivision to the south from RM16 over to the east and the railroad tracks um, to the immediate west. There is a site plan for you. Oh, excuse me. There is a site plan for your consideration. Again, um, it's the layout is the same as what was before you before. However, the number of dwelling units has been reduced down to 205 as well as some additional fencing and um, landscaping improvements are recommended or proposed rather. Here's the tree table and the existing trees to be retained and removed. They have provided building elevations again, indicating the mass and scale with the uh, agreed upon reduced heights of the buildings. And that concludes my presentation. Again, the development review compliance staff did find this consistent and there are no waivers being requested. Thank you. All right. Mr. Hay, do you have a presentation on this? I do, yes. Can I share my screen, please? Oops. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, again, David Hay, your planning commission staff. I have been sworn uh, before. Uh, the site is within the South Tampa Planning District, more specifically the Port Tampa area. There is transit uh, located at the intersection of West Varn Avenue and South Manhattan. Uh, there is a public recreation facility just to the south, and the subject site is within a level A evacuation zone. Again, we have the aerial, uh, this site, you're all familiar with it. 
McCoy. The, here's the park to the south. This is uh, the, the existing rail line now. This it should be noted that this there there was spurs going in to the property. There was spurs to the north running down into McDill Air Force Base um, in the past, but. Um, these were historically uh, non-residential, um, the single family detached uh, over time has uh, surrounded uh, these sites. Here we have uh, the future land use map, the subject site and the properties uh, to the west and that kind of rust color um, is that transitional use 24 that allows consideration for commercial, industrial, and residential. There's also more on the other side of uh, the, actually the east side of Manhattan. And then you've got uh, residential 10 in the tan and you actually have some residential 20 uh, running along Manhattan. Uh, townhomes can be considered uh, in these areas. The proposal is to rezone the property at 6603 South Trash Street from the industrial general to plan development the proposed project, uh, like Mary had said, has reduced down to uh, 205 multifamily residential units. Uh, again, the site is within that transitional use 24, future land use category. This category does not have a clear identifiable development trend allowing for the consideration residential, commercial, industrial. While historically the site has been used for industrial uses, the proposed multifamily would be more sensitive uh, to the surrounding residential uses within the Port Tampa City neighborhood. It should be noted that the site under that transitional use could be considered up for a maximum of 680,000 uh, square feet of non-residential uses if through an approved zoning. There are single family residents uh, on within one fourth of a mile of the east and south of the site and an approved plan development for multifamily within the transition use 24 to the west. Furthermore, the proposed project would be an appropriate use of the site and compatible with the surrounding residential uses. The uh, proposed project supports many of the policies in the comprehensive plan as it relates to housing the city's population. The Tampa Comprehensive Plan encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure that an adequate supply of housing is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future population. Portions of the site are within that coastal high hazard area. The coastal high hazard area is an area below the elevation of the category one storm surge. Uh, due to this staff uh, recommends that the applicant ensures that they uh, work closely with city staff during the permit uh, stage to mitigate for any potential impacts on shelter space. Also the adopted August 2016 Greenways and Trails plan update by the Metropolitan Planning Organization identifies the existing CSX uh, right of way adjacent to the subject site as a conceptual trail. In compliance with the comprehensive plan, the applicant has provided a note on the site plan addressing future connections to that trail if it's ever developed. In conclusion, the request supports many of the policies within the comprehensive plan and is consistent with the density anticipated under that transitional use 24. Based on those considerations, your Planning Commission staff continues to recommend the proposed rezoning be found consistent with the provisions of the Imagine 2040 Tampa Comprehensive Plan. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Carlson, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Hay, can I ask you a question? Um, how important is it to maintain industrial land in the Comprehensive Plan? And in particular, is it important in the Comprehensive Plan to have um, industrial land spaced out in different in different parts of the city there's two questions there uh, first um, the city does recognize industrial property as important to the city's economic health and well-being um, and looks at preserving industrially planned areas i will note that though this was industrial the plan does not recognize it and it does not fall under the policies that deal with industrial. Transitional use is a unique category that you can have all three uses. So if this was actually planned industrial, it would have a heavy industrial or light industrial land use category. 
and this site does not. Um, the plan does not address uh, um, the locations of uh, industrial. I believe it does talk about, you know, supporting the port and, and things like that, but it does not set like a ratio or anything of how much industrial per uh, planning district or anything like that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Any other council members? All right, Mr. Hay is. That's it for me. Unless All you right. have any. Any questions for Mr. Hay? Hearing and seeing none. All right. Uh, I believe that's it for the uh, the staff reports. Uh, then the applicant. May I share my screen? First, I'll introduce myself. Um, for the record, Cami Corbett, 101 East. Uh, oh, sorry, signaling to me. 101 East Kennedy Boulevard, Suite 3700, Tampa, Florida, with the law firm Pill Ward Henderson here representing the applicant. I took me a minute to get my share screen icon yep. up, and it is up. Yep. Uh, we saw your screen, but it just showed your file. Oh. Yeah. Okay. You can see that. Okay. Mm -hmm. One moment, please. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, like uh, Susan and Judge Case, uh, do greatly appreciate the opportunity to participate in the land use dispute resolution process. Um, I think everyone. Uh, was able to uh, be heard, um, including the city's concerns, the applicant's concerns, and some of the residents were able to be, have an opportunity to be heard. And we worked really hard to try to come up with something, to come up with a settlement agreement. Um, yes, we filed litigation, but we also filed the mediation process because we still think that it's better outcome for everyone to start with mediation than start with litigation. So presentation for you this hey. evening is supposed to Ms. Corbett, I, I hate to interrupt, Mr. Chairman, Martin Shelby over here. Mm, a couple yep. of things. Number one is I just uh, received word uh, that Councilman Vieira uh, got bumped out again and he's going to have to come back in. Uh, I don't know whether council wants to take a couple of minutes to be able to do that. So oh, did he just come back in? I could have sworn I just saw him. He was frozen. He says computer froze and I have to restart. So let's give him, uh, let's give him uh, two minutes before you begin. If you can, and also Ms. Corbett, if you can, if you could make that a full screen, your slideshow, so you can have it a larger screen for the um, for the council oh, members. Yes, sorry. Yes, I will start this the presentation in in uh, slide mode. Thank you, and Mr. Chairman, I would appreciate uh, council's patience in allowing uh, Councilman Vieira to not miss any part of this presentation. If he wishes to participate, which he, I, I believe he does, I know he does. Yeah, let them restart the computer real quick and we'll have everybody on the screen. It might take longer than two minutes. I don't know. I just don't want to keep council waiting, but I think it's. I don't know if council wants to take a break or not. You want to take a five minute break and give uh, let's take a five minute break and so what it's 948. Let's start at 955 just to give uh, Councilman Vieira, uh, time to restart. He's still restarting. So we'll start at 9:55. We'll uh, take it off. Uh, take it. Take it from uh, Miss Corbett. Okay, and Council, just to be able to remind you to mute your audio and um, and turn off your camera if you don't want to be seen during this time. 